presents The Day of the Triffids, a serial for broadcasting in six parts by Giles Cooper from the novel by John Wyndham. Episode 1, The End Begins. Have you finished, Bill? Nearly. One or two things to dry. I'll give you a hand. Cloth coming over. What's this thing? A very special retort. Be careful. It took a long time to make. Chemical glassware always looks as though you could make coffee in it. <laughs> I don't say you could if there was such a thing as coffee these days. How are you getting on? Not bad. We need more coal. You had a ton the other day. Oh, I want a lot more than that. Darling, what are you going to do with it? Boil up seawater for salt. Then make metallic sodium, then sodium cyanide, I hope. Surely there's an easier way of getting salt. The nearest mine's in Worcestershire. And the nearest coal mine? In Kent. And how do you get there from the Isle of Wight in these hard times? There's a tank landing craft lying off cars. She's quite sound, and Michael thinks he can get the engines running. I'm going to suggest to the committee that we load her up with a bulldozer and half a dozen trucks, run along the coast of Dover, and see if we can't bash our way through. You may not get much of a welcome from the miners. We'll take some flour and cloth to trade with them. If there are any. There were last month. Ivan was over there in the helicopter. They're fairly well organized and quite friendly. We might start a regular trade. Far better than raiding household stocks in Portsmouth. You know, it's surprising that. Uh, how little there is in people's coal cellars. It was May. Hmm? When it happened? Oh, yes. It's May now. Six years ago. Oh, come in. Oh, good, Bill. I've caught you. And your cellar. Hello. Oh, well, Spiff, we were just knocking on. Oh, no, you're not. I've got this thing working and you're going to use it. What is it? A deep recorder. Oh, I, we've got it geared to the voltage of the generator at long last, and you're both going to talk to it. Say no, what? Everything. It's for the history. Why me? Because you were in on the disaster before it even happened. From the trivet angle, at any rate. Couldn't I just write it down? No. <laughs> two reasons. One, you'll never do it, and two, the girl who will transcribe it is blind. As you very well know, seeing she's one of your wives. Sheila? Yes. Now... Come on. Well, oh, surely there's no reason to start tonight. Well, I've got to take advantage of every minute the generator's on. Now, off you go. Well, I... Lord, I don't know. It, it's difficult to think one's so back into the middle 50s. Well, half the things we've been talking about would mean nothing to someone living then. Have a heart, Bill. We were living then. Oh, you've got to be more than three. <laughs> go on, Bill. I was nine when a man called Umberto Palangeth was shown into the office of the managing director of the Arctic and European Fish Oil Company. It wasn't the first time he had been there. Ah, Mr. Palangeth, do sit down. I'm afraid I was in conference last time you came. Yes. We analyzed that sample of oil which you left for us. Yes. Very interesting. I imagine that you might think so. A vegetable oil, of course. But with a far higher vitamin content than any of your uh, fish oils. Oh, yes. Yes, I agree. As a matter of fact, to be candid, we've never seen anything quite like it. You will. It will be on the market in quantity in about uh, eight years from now. Oh, yes? <laughs> Not if you can help it. Is that your thinking? Eh? I wouldn't put it quite as crudely as that. No, 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 no. But uh, I am a crude fellow, so I'll say it for you. Also, I will tell you that you haven't got a hope of stopping it. The experimental station where this sample was produced is a long way off, both in geography and in ideology. What is your nationality, Mr. Pellinger? South American and quite irrelevant. I am a citizen of the world, not without friends. Hmm. I heard they were experimenting with sunflower seed oil, but it isn't there. No, not sunflowers. Some kind of nut? No. I understand it is an entirely new species. Um, here is a picture of it. Good Lord, what an incredible thing. It is a plant. Oh, certainly. It looks like a cross between um, a giraffe and a cairn terrier, covered in leaves. It is a cross between a great many things, some of them not nice. But in a few years' time... It will be producing a far better oil than yours at half your present price. 
What are you offering and how much do you want for it? I offer you a tray of fertilized seeds six months from now, and I want a hundred thousand pounds. Do you? Uh, if you consider all the implications, you will find that I am being very reasonable. I shall have to consult my fellow directors. Naturally. I would like an advance of twenty-five thousand pounds. That's rather high. Not really. You see, I shall have to buy myself a jet aircraft, and uh, it had better be a good one. But not good enough. He landed by night on a flat Siberian waste. A man ran up to the plane with a box under his arm and got in. Palangeth took off at once and climbed steeply. Somewhere high over the Pacific, they caught up with him and quite justifiably blew the plane to pieces. After the fragments had dropped away and the pursuers had followed them down to sea level, there was nothing left but a trail of white vapor. Only it wasn't vapor. It was a cloud of seeds, so gossamer-like that they even floated on that thin air until they drifted down into the winds of the world. Good. Keep it going, Bill. Um, how much of that is speculation? Not much. A gentleman called Fedor turned up a couple of years later and said he'd help to organize it. Laid out landing lights and so on. He'd heard the planes in pursuit of Palangeth. Besides, there's no other way to account for the fact that Triffid suddenly appeared in half a dozen different parts of the world at once. We even had one in our back garden. I was 15 at the time. Dad! Do you know there's a mystery behind the compost heap? Good. Uh, go on with you. Uh, pull the other one. No, really. It's a peculiar plant. Do come and look. Between the Burberries and the fence. There. My word, yes, Billy, you're right. Ach, it's very odd indeed. I can't find it in any of the books. Not flowers of the field or anything. It looks kind of uh, foreign. There's a sort of coiled thing, like a fern shoot in that trumpet-shaped thing at the top of the stem. Look. And a lot of dead flies floating about inside. It's no beauty, whatever it is. Uh, we'll dig it up next time we're having a bonfire. Oh, no, Dad. Please not. What do you want to do with it? Oh, study it. You know, take its measurements and keep a record of its growth. Oh, all right, then. But I wish you'd spend as much time on arithmetic as you do on nature study. Oh, Dad, it's not nature study. I was standing beside it yesterday when the four little twigs at the base of the stem began to vibrate against it. They made a sort of pattering sound. This is new. I've applied for a job I saw in the paper. It's to be a trainee with the Arctic and European Oil Company Limited. I think it's palm oil and whales and groundnuts. It might be interesting, but I don't expect I shall get it. Do sit down, Mr... Um... Mason. Oh, William Mason, sir. Ah, yes. Uh, my name's Lucknor. I'm in charge of research. Now, tell me something about yourself. What sort of thing, sir? Oh, what you like doing, why you want to join Arctic European. Uh, just talk to me. Well, sir, I'm interested in plants and animals and things that live. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like figures much, <laughs> or sitting at a desk. Hmm. Now, what experience have you? In biology at school. It was my best subject. And I've done some research on my own. On what? Well, there's a plant in our garden that nobody knows about. And I've kept a sort of record of it. What does it look like? It has a circular bowl covered with leaves, which at present is 210.5 centimeters in circumference. From it springs a stem which is 82 centimeters in circumference and 120 centimeters in height from the bowl. The whole plant standing 210 centimeters from the ground. <laughs> yes, that's very thorough. Uh, now tell me what it looks like. Oh, like a kind of shaggy leafy giraffe with no legs. What? And a leafy calyx where the head would be. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not a very good description. Oh, yes, it is. Has it got four twiglets growing straight up from the base of the stem? Yes. And inside the calyx a coil thing which might be a stamen? Yes, that's it. Indeed it is. Get me the chairman, would you? How long has it been there? Mm, six months since I noticed it. Oh, but it was well established then. Are uh, you... Uh, Walter Lucknow, sir. I have a young man sitting in front of me who's been growing a triffid in his back garden. Yes, sir, I will. 
We're going up to see him. He'll be free in a moment. Uh, a t -t terrific? I is that what it's called? Yes, and in two years' time, it will be the reason for this company's existence. But what does it do? <laughs> Produces an oil that wipes the floor with any of our present products. Some seeds were accidentally dispersed a year or two ago, and we've just had reports that specimens have been found in the tropics. I'm going out to Ecuador next week to bring some home. Yours is the first reported in a temperate country. Oh, but why Triffid? Surely that means three-pronged. Yours hasn't walked yet, I take it. Walked? Obviously not. But when it's between 18 months and two years old, it will lift its three main roots from the ground and walk on them. Hence, Triffid. But no plants walk, sir. They do now. And by the way, you've got the job. But I very nearly lost it. I went home hopping with excitement, and the first thing I did was to go into the garden and take a look at my trivid. I bent down and examined the roots. For the first time, I noticed that there were indeed three of them. I began to scrape the earth away from them with a vague idea that the thing might walk sooner. I was conscious of a slight movement about me, and then something cracked across my face like a whip. I woke up in bed with a puzzled-looking doctor standing over me. I was the first person in England to be stung by a triffid. Yes. And how did you survive it? Simply because it wasn't fully grown. By the time I'd recovered, Walter was back from Ecuador with a dozen mature specimens, and he'd already discovered that the sting would kill a man instantly. He'd also discovered that if you cut the sting off, the triffid was harmless. Well, I went down to Worthing with him, and we set up the first triffid nursery together. You know what happened in the next few years. The wretched things were so successful as oil producers that we reared more and more of them until... Well, here we are today. Yes, good. Now, can't you give me something more personal, Bill? I mean, you worked with them more than anyone. Except Walter. He really understood Triffids. Go on, Bill. <laughs> I remember once sitting on a bank looking at a field of tethered Triffids one evening, just about sunset. What a row they're making. Yes. They're talkative tonight, aren't they? I wonder if it's the weather. They seem to do it more when it's dry. Do you talk more when it's dry? Talk? Yes, do you? Well, you don't really think that's what they're doing. Well, why not? Well, it's absurd, the plants talking to each other. You once said they couldn't walk. Yes, but that's a mechanical thing. If they talked, it would mean they had some intelligence... Haven't you ever noticed that when they sting, they seem to go for the face of the hands? Yes. And especially for the eyes. Well, that's probably accidental. Possibly. But it could be because they want to reduce our advantage. Sight is our only advantage, you know. What, over those vegetables? Yes. Now, you just think. If you were blind and alone in a field with a triffid, what could you do? For a start, you'd starve to death. But the triffid wouldn't. <laughs> it could exist on flies until it found you. Then it would only have to root itself beside your body and wait. Oh, that's a nice thought. And here's another one. In some parts of Africa, they've been known to surround villages at night and kill the inhabitants. But we've never found anything like a brain. They're the same as any other plant when you dissect them. All the same, if there was uh, some catastrophe which made us weaker, it would automatically make them stronger. Especially now we stopped docking them to improve their quality. Well, I don't see what catastrophe. Probably none. But the scientists have been playing with some pretty odd things lately. <laughs> Look at all these artificial satellites. Nobody knows what's in them or how many there are. Or how controllable he may be. But uh, do you really think there's anything to worry about? I don't know. Anyhow, it's no use worrying. While there's money in Triffids, there'll be Triffids. We'll uh, tap this lot tomorrow. Uh, have my mask and gloves ready, will you?
I've often wondered what happened to Walter. He'd have been useful to us now. It was a year afterwards that he saved my eyesight and my life. We were examining some specimens when one of them smacked out at me with its sting and a few drops of poison came through the meshes of the mask and went into my eyes. He got me back to the lab at once and gave me the antidote. But I had to go into hospital for a week or two. They sent me to St. Mary's right in the middle of London. I'd been there ten days when the night of the green flashes took place. You probably remember how reports came in over the air all day long from places which were already having their night, telling of a fantastic display of lights in the upper atmosphere, and by evening, everyone who could get to a window or climb on a roof was gazing up, hoping for a free firework display. As soon as darkness fell, I could hear the ahs and oohs, not only from the hospital staff, but from the whole city outside. I began to feel that a gigantic party was being given to which only I had not been invited. Do shut the window, nurse. Oh, this is marvellous, Mr. Mason. Really, it is. They say it's a comet, you know. Green and white flashes all over the sky. And bright red buses clashing their gears all down the street, I know. Surely you can see just as well with it shut. Oh, aren't we just in a bad mood tonight? Of course. It's a shame, really, you having your eyes still bandaged. Still, it's not for long now. What time tomorrow will they do the unbandaging? Sister said 11.30, but Mr. Palmer may be a bit late. Oh. Oh. What's happened? Oh, that was a bright one. It lit up the whole room. You could see everybody standing on the rooftops watching. Oh. Oh, there's another. It's quite dazzling. Oh, what a pity you couldn't see it. Yes, isn't it? Now, do go away. There's a good girl. Have you everything you want? Yes, I think so. Is the radio there where it should be? Yes. Then I'll leave you for some now. music. I, I look in there to see you're settled down. Good night. Good night. Oh, and there's another tremendous flash right across oh, the whole sky. No. I expect you can hear the crowd. They're like children at a firework display. From where I'm standing on the top of Primrose Hill, I can see hundreds of faces all turned upwards to watch this astonishing spectacle which began over the Pacific 12 hours ago and by now must have been seen by 90% of the world's population. It's believed that the Earth is passing through a belt of meteoric debris caused by the passing of a comet, and I really, I really do urge anyone who possibly can to watch it. The whole sky is pulsating with vivid streaks and flashes of light, and the whole of London, right across to the Surrey Hills, stands out brilliantly in the hard green glare. <laughs> All the usual features of a London crowd are present, from the man with a sandwich board announcing the end of the world, to the man you can probably hear not far away from me. Yes, he's doing quite a good trade, too. Some of the brighter flashes really make you blink. Oh, there's a splendid one right across. Oh, shut up and let me get some sleep. Six, seven, eight. Oh, it must be seven. It is eight. What a damned disorganized hospital. Where's that bell? Well, come on! Nurse! Sister! Hey, come here! You competent fools leaving me like this, but there was a fire. Nurse! Nurse! Who's that? Is someone there? Whose room's this? Mine. Aren't you the house surgeon? Yes. Mr. Mason. Oh, can't you see? No. What? I'm blind. I woke up blind. I've been trying to find someone to help me. I'm afraid I'm in the same state unless you care to help me off with these bandages. Where are you? Here. No, that's the end of the bed. Now, look, work your way up my, my hand. <laughs> we must look a comic couple. I'm not laughing. I won't be if the treatment hasn't worked. There's a pin at the back I can't quite manipulate. And that? <clears throat> Thanks. It's like unwinding a maple. Well, you better do it yourself. 
Are the curtains drawn? I suppose so. Nobody's coming to undraw them. The whole staff must have a hangover or something after last night. I can see. Clearly? Perfectly. The curtains are green. I always thought they were blue. I don't know why. Well, it's lucky my clothes are here. Oh, you don't know what it's like being able to see again. I can imagine. Oh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. How can I help you? Take me along the passage to Lister Ward. There's a telephone in the sister's room. Oh, this way. Oh, hold my arm. All right? Yes? The place sounds like a madhouse. There must be someone on duty somewhere. Is the ward at the end of the passage? There's a swing door. Sister's room is on the right before you get there. Hey, you! Uh, wait a moment. There's someone in the ward calling out. We'd better see what they want. It's all dark. Anything wrong? I pull the curtains back, mate. All right. Wait here, Doctor. We can't leave them in the dark. No, of course not. There. Oh, go on. What? What am I about, mate? Pull the curtains proper. We can't see a thing. Yeah, go on, pull them. But I have. He's blind too, like me. We're all blind. Oh! Quick, let's get out of here. This looks like the room. Give me the telephone. On the table. There. Oh, dead. I thought it would be. What's happened? What is it? Everyone's blind. Finished. There must be something we can do. Yes. This is the fifth floor, isn't it? Yes. Where's the window? You're facing it. Thank you. No. Oh. oh, God. Oh, my God. I, 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 where's anyone? Come on. the stairs and can't see. He knocked me over. I couldn't see him coming. Is that Mr. Mason? Yes. I took the bandages off. I can see. Are you hurt? Close to bed, that's all. I was washing the diabetic in number seven. And I suddenly couldn't see. And he couldn't either. Then I went for help. But there's nobody. All right, all right. Don't worry. Let's get out of this place. Which is the best way? Straight down these stairs and through the main hall. What about the man who fell? I'm afraid he's dead. Oh, no! Hold on. Now, there are four steps coming. One, two, three. Here's the landing. You turn right. What's that? The children's ward. Oh, we must go to them. There's nothing we can do at the moment. Look, four more steps. Now, turn right. Here's the main hall. Across here. Stop now. Here's the door. Now, forward. No. I'd rather stay here. I don't want to go out. This place is a nightmare. What place isn't like this? Besides, I know my way around here. Blindfold. There'll be no food. Nothing. I feel safer here. Besides, there are the children. What can you do for them? Make them a little less frightened. I am a nurse, after all. You want me to stay? No. You must go out and do what you can. Goodbye. The street was empty and horribly silent. There seemed no particular reason to go in any direction, but after a moment's pause, I set off towards the West End. 
skirting a fruit lorry which had run across the pavement and deposited its load of oranges in the gutter. I badly wanted a drink. I crossed the road to a pub called the, the Alamein Arms. The door was open and a lugubrious song came from the interior. Yes. Oh, that's gin. What's this one? <coughs> ports. It's a blaze with ports. Hi. Who's that? Are you open? Just broken the window, haven't I? Of course I'm open. I need a drink. Who are you, anyway? From the hospital. Can you see? Yes. Is, is this whiskey I've got here? Uh, no, peppermint. To blaze with peppermint. Find me a bottle of whiskey, Doc. Okay. I'm doctor enough for that, anyhow. This one's whiskey. Thanks. Help yourself. I'll have a brandy, if I may. Anything you like. <sighs> you get drunk if you take it down like that. I am drunk. And I've got to get drunker. Do you know what? I'm blind. That's what I am. I'm blind as a bat. Everybody's blind as a bat except you. Except ruddy comet. Green shooting stars. Now everyone's blind. Do you see green shooting stars? No. There you are then. Proves it. You didn't see him. You are blind. Everyone else saw him. All blind as bats. Are you sure it's everyone? Listen. You can't hear yourself talk here most days. Not with the door open. I see what you mean. It's obvious, really. Are you the landlord? What if I am? I want to pay. Ah, forget it. You know why? Because money's no use to a dead man. That's what I am after a few more drinks. You look all right. What's the good of living? Blind as a bat. That's what my wife said. She was right. And she more guts than what I have. When she found out the kids were blind too, she took them into her bed with her and turned on the gas. Oh my That's God. what she did. I hadn't the guts to stick with them. But I will have soon. I'm going back up there soon when I'm drunk enough. No. Why not? Give me one reason why not. You can't. It's wrong. No. Nothing's left to be wrong. If you can't see that, you're blinder than me. I'm drunk enough to do it now. Here I come, girls. Here I come. I didn't stop him or try to follow him. I watched him go. Then I knocked back the last of my brandy and went out into the silent street. <laughs> That was episode one of The Day of the Triffids, a serial for broadcasting in six episodes by Giles Cooper from the novel by John Wyndham, with Patrick Barr as Bill Mason. Production for the BBC is by Peter Watts. The BBC presents The Day of the Triffids. There's another tremendous flash. It's believed that the Earth is passing through the debris of a comet. There's another. So brilliant it almost hurts. I really, I really do urge anyone who possibly can to go out and watch.
Episode 2, A Light in the Night. It took me quite a time to realize that London was a city of the blind, the capital of a blind country and a blind world. But by the time I'd walked from the hospital to Piccadilly, I knew it was so. In no direction was there any traffic, nor any sound of it. The only signs of life were a few people here and there cautiously groping their ways along the shop fronts. Outside a famous provision shop, I came upon a group of people gathered round a small child which still seemed to have its sight. What's in this window? Mummy. Come on, what's in the window? Oh, he's only three. He doesn't understand, do you, dear? It's all the eyes we've got. Yes. Come on, kid. Tell us what's in the window. Give you a sweet eat. Tell us, darling, what's in the window? Is it numbs? Nothing, ma'am. Tell us what you see. No. Tell us. No. Tell us, you brat, or I'll wring your neck. No. Stop. Who's that? Well, don't bully the child. We've got to find food. Well, there's none in that window. It's full of china. He can see. That's right. That's right. You can see, can't you? Show us a window with some grub in it. All right, all right. This way. So we're starving. Yes. This one, the one you're facing now, there's a ham in it. Okay. Here you go. Oh. Oh. Mind you, don't cut yourself. Where's the bloke that can see? He can put his hand in. Where is he? Here, beside me. Well, hold on to him. I've got him. Is it you? You can see, can't you? I know it's him. All right, then. Put your hand through the window and get us some food. Let me go, then. Oh, no, you're staying with us. That's what you think. <laughs> Stop him! Stop him! <laughs> Someone's there. Uh, I can hear you. All right, don't answer. Just stay where you are and don't bump into me. I've had enough of that this morning. Oh, I, I'm sorry. You're blind. Of course I'm blind. You think I carry a white stick for fun? Then you don't know what's happened. I know everyone's jolly clumsy this morning. And no hall porter on duty. They were all blind, too, since they watched the comet last night. Oh. It was pure chance I didn't. Now they'll know what it's been like for me since 1917. Now they'll need their infernal patronage for themselves. I'm at the Regent Street end of Swallow Street, am I not? Yes. What does it all look like? There aren't very many people about, no traffic. Just a couple of buses abandoned in the circus. Most of the people are creeping along against the walls. Oh. You might see me across the road. Of course. Not that there's any traffic, but one gets lost away from the curb. What's that? It sounds as though some of them have broken into a pub around the corner. The fools. It's most unpleasant being drunk when you're blind. You'll do all right for free drink, though, won't you? Oh, I keep away from groups. Once they find you can see, they won't let you go. If you're worrying about that with me, you needn't. I'm very well able to look after myself. Yes, I'm sure. Here's the curb. Thank you very much. Good luck to you. Good day. No, I won't. Oh, but you're told, my dear. Don't you forget it. Where I go, you go. Stop, let her go. You go away, you oh, fool. Oh, no, you don't. All right. Up you get. I'm, I'm tied to him. Not now. I've cut the cord. There's an empty pub over there. Let's get away from the crowd. But you can see. Certainly I can. Oh, thank heavens. I thought I was the only one that... Oh. Feeling better? Yes. I must look an awful sight. Where's the mirror? Oh, my goodness, yes, I do. Will you have another drink? A small one. Then I must go. Where? Home. 
I, I was going for the doctor and... Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't told you anything about myself. My name's Bill Mason, by the way. I'm Josella Platon. Oh, haven't I heard of you? I shouldn't think so. Uh, how did you escape seeing the comet? I was in hospital with my eyes bandaged. <laughs> what about you? Well, disgraceful, really. I went to a party on... What's today? Wednesday? On Monday night. And goodness knows what they'd put in the drinks. <laughs> because I felt like death yesterday. <laughs> about four o'clock, I gave up the struggle, took a couple of sleeping tablets and went to bed. If the sky had fallen in, I wouldn't have noticed. When I did wake... My father was standing beside the bed. He'd gone blind. So had the servants. Where do you live? Dean Road, St. John's Wood. The telephone wouldn't work. So I got out the car and drove down this way to fetch our doctor. I was in such a panic, I forgot she was nearly dry of petrol. And she stopped in the middle of Regent Street. And then that man found out I could see. He knocked me down and tied my hands, then made me lead him about. From bar to bar, I imagine. Yes. I should have been able to get away from him, but he... Well, I, I was sorry for him in a way. One's sorry for them all, but they're dangerous. In a way, we're rich and they're poor. Why did he start beating you? Because I wouldn't go into his house with him. Thank heaven you came along. And what do we do now? I must go back to father. There's no point in trying to find the doctor, even if he's been one of the lucky ones. Would you mind if I came to? I'd have asked you to. Only I thought perhaps you had someone to look for. No, my parents are dead and I have no other attachments. Then I'd be very glad. It's the awful loneliness. I know. And I think it'd be wiser for us to stay together anyhow. Shall we go? Yes. Where can I get petrol? No need. What? There are plenty of other cars. Oh, funny. Like a dream, being able to take anything we want. Seeing the sort of dream it is, I think we might break into that shop over the road. What for? A couple of good, sharp knives. Oh. No good. The driver of that bus must have gone blind at the wheel. We'll never get round it. If you turn, there's a side street about 50 yards back. That'll lead us round into Dean Road. What on earth is that? <laughs> the zoo. We hear the lions at night. They'll be hungry. It's past feeding time. I suppose they'll starve. Poor brutes being locked up like that. It's just as well for us that they are. Are they blind, do you think? I don't know. Some, but not the cats, though. They'd have avoided the light. Look, over in the park there. Triffids. There's an enclosure of them by the zoo. Should they be loose like that? No, but if you don't keep an eye on them, they do tend to root themselves in a cluster against the fencing until it falls down. Horrid things. Still, if it wasn't for a triffid sting, I wouldn't be here now. Here, on the left. Lucky I've still got my key. It's no use ringing the bell. Your father? Yes, I, I just saw him lying on the ground with a triffid standing over him. Oh, what can we do? Nothing. I'm afraid there's nothing. I mean, he's dead. Wait, uh, I'll just edge it open. Oh. Yes, I, I, I saw the mark on his face. Gisela, it's a very quick death. Look out, coming through those bushes. Run for the car. Wind up the window. Drive on. Drive on before it gets to us. No, wait. It can't hurt us now. I want to see what it will do. It's coming right up to us. We're safe in the car. Oh, that beast you're rattling. It's going away now. There's another one standing there in the laurels. Oh, let's get away. 
You were right. There's nothing we can do. You're sure? Yes. Where can we go? For a start, we make for a factory in Clarkenwell. Wentworth. They make the best tripping guns in the world. Here's the export stock already for packing. One for you, one for me, and uh, one spare. I didn't know there were such things. They use them a good bit in the tropics. Look, this is how they work. Pull back the spring so, and the boat fits into this notch. Mm -hmm. Then shove one of these steel slivers. Look out there, sharp. Shove it into the holder. Take aim and press the trigger. It'll cut the stem off a trivet at 25 yards. I can't wait to use it. We won't see many as long as we stay in the center of London. Now then, we'll have those two masks. Yes. Ah, and the gauntlets. All right. And a couple of cases of ammunition. You'll never get them in the car. There's a station wagon outside. We'll take that. When next? Back up west. Clothes first. Then somewhere to sleep before it gets dark. A flat, I should think, or, or two flats, if you'd prefer it. One flat, please. I'd rather not be on my own. Good. I feel like company, too. Let's try this block. It looks pretty luxurious. There's nothing to pay. But can we really walk into somebody's flat and take it over? People who can't or won't do that sort of thing are going to have a pretty thin time from now on. Let's choose a top floor if we can. It's a long way to carry the suitcases. But what about the lift? No power. Oh, of course. All the same, I'd still prefer to be high up and away from the street. All right. Let's make for the penthouse. <laughs> what about the trippy guns? Leave them. Nobody's going to steal them. If they do, we'll get some more. <laughs> Something simple. Such as climbing five floors with everything, including the kitchen stove. What? I took a paraffin cooker from the camping department. We'll need it. Come on. Up we go. Oh. <laughs> what a climb. I should think it's the first time this floor's been reached on foot. <laughs> Two flats. Which do you prefer? Uh, the south-facing one. As Madame wishes. Well, let's hope this is a master key I find. The doors look solid. Yes, it is. After you. No. Uh, let's try the other. What's wrong with it? It's not well furnished. No. What was it? Nothing much. Here we are. Was someone in there? Yes, two people, both dead. Suicide? Yes. There's a lot of it about. Uh, Come on. Oh, no, no. We can't sleep here with them across the passage. And you're making a joke of it. Listen, Gisela, if we're going to keep our sanity, you and I have got to grow a hide and a thick one, too. People are dying all over the world, some by their own hand, some by accident... Soon a lot more people will die of starvation. Oh, and there's nothing we can do about it, nothing at all. Do you understand? Yes, I, I do. I'm sorry. Well, let's see what this place has to offer. My goodness. Done up regardless. And the cocktail bar. What sort of rent do they pay? About 2000 a year. Good Lord, is this a bedroom? I say, look, it's got a round bed. With a mirror over it. <laughs> Madly glamorous. Especially when you wake up with a hangover in the morning. Oh, don't be discouraging. <laughs> I'm going to sleep now, anyway. I'll see if I can find something a bit more sober. There's a mirror over the bath as well. That is the end. Oh, I don't know. Anyhow, you won't be able to use it. No hot water. But don't sound so pleased. Are you going to change? I'll do my shirt. 
It's lucky it's summer. What? Lucky it's summer. Cold weather wouldn't have helped. In some ways it would. How? Most of the fresh food will be going off tomorrow. The fridge is like an oven. Are you in the kitchen? Yeah. What's it like? A housewife's dream. I'm setting up the oil cooker. The housewife's nightmare. <laughs> Can you cook? Um, uh, boiled eggs, standard. Uh. There's a lipstick here I've always wanted to use and never dared to ask for. Bill? Bill! Yes? Sorry. I thought perhaps you'd gone out. You didn't answer. I couldn't think of anything to say. What are you doing? Preparing a simple meal. Oh. Well, I ought to be doing that. No, no, no. I'm enjoying myself. Shall we sit at the table? Oh, yes. Let's do things properly. That's how I feel. What are we having? Uh, avocado pear, fried scampi, <laughs> cold chicken and salad with asparagus tips. Peaches and coffee. What? No caviar? That's in a pot. It'll keep. Oh. Will a white burgundy suit you, or would you prefer champagne? I'm in your hands. Very well, then. There's a good-looking batter on old here. I'll lay the table. Bill! I was busy. Sorry. What are you doing, anyway? Putting on the lot? Yes. I can't wait. Blimey. How, how does it look? It looks... You look beautiful. Thank you. Where did the dress come from? I found it in there and tried it. It, it fits. It does. Emeralds suit you. I've always wanted some. Funny time to get them. I know. You're saying goodbye, aren't you? So you do understand. I hoped you would. I'm glad you've done it anyway. My father told me once that just before 1939, when everyone knew there was going to be a war, he used to go around London looking at everything as though it was for the last time. Now it really is. Thank you for understanding. Thank you for everything, in fact. If you hadn't helped me when you did, I don't know where I should be by now. I know where I'd be now if I hadn't met you, lying drunk and maudlin in some bar. Oh. Uh, talking of that, shall we have a drink? I can recommend the sherry. Thank you. Here's to you. And you. My goodness, I'm hungry. So am I. Napkin? Thank you. It's getting dark. What should we do for a light? Oh, well, there are candles among our loot. Oh, no, wait a minute. Yeah. What do you think these are? Small models of the Venus de Milo. And also a rather decadent type of candle. Matches? Oh, oh good <laughs> heavens, what will they think of me? What, indeed? Sorry, stupid remark. But I'd have sat around in darkness without realizing there were candles at all. Shows what a misspent life I've led. Tell me about it. Tell you what? Everything. Childhood memories, love affairs, why you aren't married, or... Or are you? No, I'm, I'm not. Are you? No. I, I nearly was when I was 19. It was a fearful row. With your family? With my father. Mother was dead by then. I ran away from home and went to live with a girlfriend. He cut off my allowance, so I had to do something. And I wrote the book. You did what? That's what they all say. It must look awfully dumb. I wrote the book. What book? Uh, it was called... Sex is my adventure. Jocella Platon, of course. Did you write that thing? Yes. Did you read it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was very mild. Rather silly, really. Only the title was shocking. But it sold like anything, and the film rights. Made a lot of money. That's why I went home again. Having shown your independence. Mm. And to get away from the people who thought I meant the whole thing literally. Which you did not. Which I did not. Still, you can hardly blame people. No. That's why I was writing another book, to uh, balance things up. With an equally alarming title? I was calling it Here the Forsaken. Uh, quotation? Congreve. Here the Forsaken Virgin Rests from Love. Oh. <clears throat> uh, ready for the next course? 
Charlie, Max. Brandy, port, more liqueur. Brandy, please. Oh, I suppose we ought to wash up. No, we won't be here long and nobody else will be using the plate. That brings us back to Earth with a bump. I know, but I think we ought to rough out a plan of campaign. Oh, let's have a few moments more. There ought to be soft music. Is that a gramophone? An electric one. Oh, pity. There's a battery-operated wireless in the kitchen. I tried it earlier, but there was nothing to do it. Oh, let's have another try. I don't know what you expect to hear, but it won't be soft music until you learn. You never know. Somebody, somewhere, might have something to say. Oh, don't knock my brandy over. It's too good to waste. Nothing. Nothing. Wait a minute. I can hear something. I can't? Yes. There. It's Morse. Terribly faint. I've got it. It's SOS. Oh. Where is he, do you think? I don't know. Some ship drifting off the coast with all the crew blind. Just summer. Think of the ships. And the prisons. What's happened in them? Aircraft, too. Their troubles must be over. Not like ours. Which brings us back to where we started. All right. I'm down out of the clouds now. What are we going to do? Get out of London for a start. What? And keep away from towns as much as we can. Supplies will be difficult in the country. Yes, but don't you see what's going to happen here? There's still water in the tanks. Soon there won't be any, and the whole city will begin to stink like a great sewer. There are some bodies lying about already, and every day there'll be more. You don't have to tell me that. Sorry, but, you see, it means that soon diseases will begin to spread. Cholera, typhus, Lord knows what... It's important to get away before anything of that kind starts. Have you any ideas where we might go? Somewhere out of the way, I suppose. We'll want a good water supply, and as high up as we can get so that there's a nice clean wind. That's a thorn. The Lake District. Too far. Maybe. Yeah, the same goes for Cornwall. We'll be dependent on towns when we can use them again. What about the South Downs? I've some friends who have a lovely old farmhouse on the north side, looking across to Pulbra. It's fairly high, and there's a wind pump for water. Well, they make their own electricity, too. It's a bit near civilization. How long ought we to leave the towns to themselves? Oh, a year or so. That ought to be long enough. We're going to need a stack of supplies. Yes, well, I suggest that the first thing we do tomorrow is to load up a lorry with stores, or two lorries, if you can manage one. I can try. What do we put in them? Pencil and paper. Let's make a list. It's like Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go for a couple of ten tonners and load half each with food. Tinned meat and flour as basic, and as many luxuries as we can fit into the cracks between. What you call luxuries? Anything that's not absolutely necessary, but will give us variety. Sardines, tin fruit and vegetables, biscuits, all that sort of thing. Condensed milk? Please. Yes, or dried. We'll find some large grocers that haven't been broken into and make our final selection on the spot. What else? We'll need winter things. Blankets. Note them down. We'd better take a couple of camp beds, too, and a tent in case of emergencies. A tent? Cooking things? Yes, frying pans, saucepans, kettles. Ooh. About three of everything. What about paraffin? We we'll use the stocks in the roadside garages. Matches? Thousands of them. <laughs> we don't want to have to rub sticks together before we need. <laughs> Candles and lamps. Yes, uh, torches and batteries. What about first aid kit? yes. And any medicines that strike us as possibly useful. Brandy. Yes, a couple of cases. And a supply of mineral water for emergencies on the way. We've got the traffic guns. A couple of shotguns, about 5,000 rounds of ammunition, a rifle, a couple of revolvers. Fishing rods might be handy if we're living off the land. Nets and explosives will be handier. We'd better have a last and some cobbler's equipment, as well as all the shoes we can carry. <laughs> a sewing machine. Barber's clippers. Who's going to use them? You. On me every fortnight. Oh? And what about me? Oh, you just have to evolve a hairstyle I can cope with. We are going to have to learn a lot. We've learnt a lot already. Such as? How to accept the fact that sooner or later we may be the only survivors. <laughs> <laughs> 
There must be others like us somewhere. I've met nobody in London, except a child who was too young to talk, too young to stay up and watch the comet or whatever it was. Well, what else could it have been? You know every great power has had satellites whirling round overhead for the last few years. You also know that they aren't all for research. Some of them are weapons, ready to be brought down when needed. Supposing one of them went wrong, collided with a meteorite, perhaps, and instead of doing what it was supposed to do, which was to burst low down, affecting one country, it burst up in its orbit, affecting the whole world. But who would think up a weapon that would make people blind? Any nation on Earth that was rich enough or frightened enough. And that means all of us. Oh. Well, let's get on with the list. Oh, no. Let's do it in the morning. All right. Ooh. We've all the time in the world, in one sense. Nobody else seems to want it. It was a good dinner. Thank you. Thank you for adorning it. Some things were fun. Stay there a moment. Why? You're a sight that I shall never see again. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Priscilla, darling, don't. I tried to go to sleep. I was tired. And, and then I began to hear... Them. Calm now, darling, calm. There's nothing we can do, not yet. Oh, Bill. Oh, Bill, if you weren't here, I'd go mad. As long as we're together, we'll survive. But, but there's so many of them, and, and only two of us. Look. No, no, I won't look out. You must, Priscilla, there's a light. House is on fire, I've seen. No, this is different. A searchlight. What? Look, over there to the north. Oh. oh, yes, I see. It's a signal. What does it mean? That someone is trying to get all the sighted people together. Quick, let's go there. Not yet. Now we'll wait till morning. But then there'll be no light. We must go now. Do you really want to drive through those streets now? Oh, no. But if we miss... They won't go away tonight. We'll make a mark on the window ledge... Where's something? Oh, here we are, a metal file. That'll do. If I scratch a pointer, there. We'll be able to pick out the building in the morning. You can see it's a tall one from the position of the light. All right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, dear, I panicked a bit. You'd be inhuman not to. But now we know that we are not alone. We never were, Bill. Were we? <laughs> was episode two of The Day of the Triffids, a serial for broadcasting in six parts by Giles Cooper from the novel by John Wyndham, with Patrick Barr as Bill Mason and Monica Gray as Josella Payton. Production for the BBC by Peter Watts. The BBC presents The Day of the Triffids. Gisela, there's a light. A searchlight? What does it mean? Someone's trying to get the sighted people together. Then we're not alone. Scratch a pointer on the window ledge, then first thing in the morning, we'll identify the building. <laughs> Episode 3, Conference and Confusion. I lay awake for a long time on that first night after the disaster, listening to the shuffling and tapping of the blind in the street below. 
When I did go to sleep, I slept heavily and late. I woke to find the sun shining and Gisela making coffee on the oil stove. She was wearing a ski suit. And jolly nice she looked at it. Hello, Bill. Ready for breakfast? I'll shave first. I feel a bit scruffy. Shall I hit some water? No, I'll manage with coal. There's one of those patent creams in the bathroom. Hang on, I'm forgetting about that light we saw. Let's take a look at the mark we made and see where it came from. I did, before you woke. It points towards London University Tower. Yes, it would be that direction. Oh, and look, they're flying two flags. That's it, all right. We better go straight there after we've eaten. It's funny. The streets are quite different from yesterday. Fewer people about. And look how they creep along the gutter. Yesterday they were all clinging to the house fronts. It's easier going by the curb. This is the turning we want. Steady. I think there's something happening at the gates. There's quite a crowd. Do we investigate or clear out? Investigate. I think so, but uh, don't let's get embroiled. If we got through those houses and into one of the gardens, we could work our way quite close to the gates without being seen. If there's anyone to see us, come on. Be reasonable. There's nothing we can do about you. And who do you think you are to shut yourselves up in there? Who do you think you are? You didn't think that I'm one of these helpless wretches and can't see you. I can see you, all right. What's happening? Come up beside me. But look here. There's a sort of agitator chap trying to get in. Be reasonable. He's arguing with that chap inside the gate. Do you think all these people haven't got the same right to live as you? They have, you know. It's not their fault they're blind, is it? It's nobody's fault. But it's going to be your fault if they starve, and you know it. Yes. I've been showing them where to get food. But there's only one of me, and there's thousands of them. You could help them too, but you won't. All you think of is looking after your own lousy skins. But look here. How long do you think the supplies will last? How the blaze is what I know. What I do know is that of all us blokes who've still got our eyes, don't muck in and help. There aren't going to be many left alive by the time they come to clear this mess up. But who do you think is going to come? Oh, that's it, is it? You're scared. Frightened that if you give them food, there won't be enough for you. Lovely people, aren't they? Well, if you won't come out to us, we'll come in to you. Let go! Yes, he's on. Yeah. Hold him Hold while I undo the gate. Let me go! Johnson! Edwards! Bring the stands! Coming! Don't shoot! Ah! Ah! Oh, no. To shoot at them like that. They fired over their head. How'd you know? If they'd fired into that crowd with two Sten guns at a range of 20 yards, the street wouldn't be empty now. But all the same, even to frighten them like that. They had to do something. That man, the one who spoke, was right. In a way. You know he was. But he was wrong as well. You see, there is no they to come and clear up this mess. It won't be cleared up except by us. And one of the things we simply cannot afford to do is to spend our entire time pillaging food stocks on behalf of other people. Because when the stocks are gone, well, what will anyone eat? It seems so careless. <laughs> I don't like it any more than you do, but we've got to make up our minds. Do we help the ones who've still got their sight to rebuild some sort of life, or, or do we make a moral gesture? No. You're right, Bill. We've got to go on. Then let's go over. But the men with the guns... They won't hurt us. We are sighted. Can you get down? Give me a hand. There. Can we come in? How many of you? Just the two. We saw your signal last night. Okay, come on over. We, uh, we had a bit of a party just now. Yes, we saw it. Those were the orders. Not to let them in. You better report to the colonel, just inside, on the right. The door marked reception. Highly organized. Rather alarming. This seems to be it. Come in. Newcomers, glad to have you with us. I'll just take a few particulars. Your name, sir? Mason. Initials? W.J. Address? The Twitten, Panghurst, near Worthing, if it makes any difference. We must keep the record straight. I'm hoping to get a form run off as soon as we collect someone who can work a duplicator. Age? 29. Occupation? 
Terrific grow. <laughs> Not much call for that now, I'm afraid. And, uh, and you? Clayton J.V. of 42 Dean Road, N.W. 8. Age 22 and no particular occupation. Independent. Very. Miss, I presume? Yes. Well, we need good men. Nasty business, this, but there's plenty to be done. Ah, oh, Mr. Beadley. Hello? Two new arrivals, Mr. Mason and Miss Clayton, passed to you for action. Oh, how do you do? Uh, come across to my office. Sure you don't want references in triplicate? Oh, you're thinking of the colonel. Yes, he's a bit of a civil servant. Still, he's right in a way. We've got to get ourselves organized. Go in here. What's the position at the moment? Well, so far, there are about 35 of us. And we hope some more will come in during the day. Have they all got their sight? 28 of them. The rest are relatives or children. Now, at the moment, the general idea is that we move away from here sometime tomorrow and go down to the country. We were going down this afternoon. Oh, what transport have you got? A station wagon. We haven't stocked it up yet. We've got a lot of anti triffid gear. <laughs> Well, that's a funny thing to make your first essential. Not as funny as all that. I think they're going to be a good deal of trouble. Oh, but surely there aren't enough to cause a lot of bother. There are plenty in the nurseries. Oh, yes, but they're all fenced in. Oh, still, bring the gear by all means if you think it'll come in handy. Oh, by the way, you do want to come with us. I think so, uh, Gisela? Yes. Good. Then here's what I suggest. Dump your stuff and then drive your car off and swap it for a good big lorry. Right. Oh, do either of you know anything about doctoring? Not a thing. <laughs> Nor me. Oh, pity. Otherwise, I'd have sent you off on a medical scrounge. Uh, you'd better go after the stuff on uh, on this list. Pots and pans, blankets and food. Yes. And concentrate on bulk. Cans and packets are your best line. Do as much as you can before dark. There'll be a general meeting and discussion here about 9.30 this evening. Right up. Well, have you got a pistol? Uh, no. You better have, just in case. And you, Miss Clayton. Here. Sure. Less messy than that, uh, that knife. Oh, I feel like a gangster. Well, that's better than being a gangster's mole, which is what you'll become if some of the citizens of this town get hold of you. I know. Well, see you this evening. And good scrounging. Whoa! Whoa! Switch off. Sorry about that. You must double declutch when you change down on these things. You can't just slide through as you can on a car. Yes, I see. Otherwise, it's not too bad. <laughs> you were doing fine till then. Get a bit wired on corners. It's like having a row of houses behind you. <laughs> Lucky there aren't many people in these parts. That's because it happened after working hours. If people had gone blind in the daytime, Lord knows what it would be like. Awful to think of them still in their houses. Piano and Stephanie and Kensington. Not only awful, but quite unprofitable. Sorry. What's the next warehouse on our list? Um, a, a blanket wholesaler in Tooley Street. And then back we go. I'm stiff after all that loading up. What do you think I am? Uh, think you can manage to drive? That's for you to say. <laughs> yes, you'll do. And I'll follow you down in the other truck. Right. Mark it there. Oh, Miss Clayton, isn't it? Which list were you working from? Fifteen. Oh, here, here's Bill. All right, Bill. Straighten it up. That's fine. Well, how have you made out? We've got all this stuff on the list. And a bit more besides. We've made a couple of plans of where it's all packed in case you want to find anything in particular. Oh, jolly good. I wish they'd all do that. Is this triffy beer you put down here? Yes, I thought it might come in useful. Oh, yes, of course. You brought a lot in this morning, didn't you? It doesn't take up much room. Still, <coughs> oh, well, leave it on for the moment. I dare say you could do with a cup of tea. There's a canteen operating in the hall. All right, the next one in. Come along. Watch out, 
There were far more people here than there were this morning. Yes. Uh, do you notice those girls over there, all sitting together? They're blind, aren't they? But not helpless. They must come from some institute. Wonder why. Excuse me, Mr. Mason and Miss Platon? Yes. yes. Good. Keep quiet still, please. I want a picture of you. <coughs> Don't tell me you're the press. Oh, more or less. At least I'm the official record. Elspeth Carey is the name, formerly of the Post. This sounds like the colonels do it. <laughs> it is. I say, are you really just Stella Platon? Yes. And I wrote that book, and none of it's true. And I really don't see why the one static thing in a collapsing world should be my reputation. Oh, fair enough. Somebody said you were worried about Triffids. I am. They think he's got a bee in his bonnet about them. And have you? I think they're troublesome enough to be taken seriously when they get out of hand. Yes, but surely that couldn't happen in England. All sorts of things can happen in England now. Yes, but... Oh, there's Ivan. He may be able to tell us something. He's been cruising round in a helicopter all afternoon. Ivan! Hello. Oh, Bill Mason, Drisella Clayton. This is Ivan Simpson. How do you do? Our yeah. intrepid bird man. Well, did you see any triffids wandering round outside London? Triffids? Hmm. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. Not that you'd notice them much from the air, and besides, I was too busy following roads to take in much else. Uh, what are the roads like? Not too bad. Most of the drivers seem to have had time to pull up, and of course, it wasn't a busy time of day. I went as far as Reading, and they seemed pretty clear. Did you see many people? Hardly a soul. They don't go out very much. Everybody in the lecture theatre, please, for a conference. Oh, yes, yes, yes. What do you think this is going to be about? Tomorrow's routine and so on. <laughs> We're a funny mixed crowd. Michael Beadley seems to be organizing the platform. All very efficient. They've even got a gavel. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and it's probably the last time I shall use that phrase. <laughs> the, uh, the committee has appointed me as its chairman, and now I'm going to introduce them to you. But first of all, I want to say this. The world we knew has ended in a flash. And some of us may be feeling that it's the end of everything. It isn't, you know, unless we allow it to be. We've got to count our blessings, and whatever happens, avoid being sorry for ourselves. After all, if this disaster hadn't come upon us, you know, it's quite possible that something worse might have happened. And we've known that it might since the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. As it is, as it is, we have our health, the earth is intact, unscarred and still fruitful. We can begin to build again and we must start now. Very well said. Now, as we know, one of our main worries today has been that we've not come across anyone with medical knowledge. And so I'm particularly glad to welcome Miss Spur, who is not actually a doctor, but does hold high nursing qualifications. I'd like you to say a few words, Miss Burr. Oh, my goodness. Um, must I? Uh, please. I can only say that I do everything I possibly can. Uh, we must expect a certain amount of infection to be about in the next few days, and you can help us to avoid it by reporting at once if you feel at all unwell, and by eating nothing that has been exposed to the air, and by drinking nothing unless it has been boiled or comes out of a bottle. <laughs> Quiet, please. Um, after the meeting, will everyone please line up to be inoculated against typhoid, paratyphoid, and cholera? Thank you very much, Miss Burr. Our last speaker is going to talk on a rather different subject. Here is Dr. Vallis, who is Professor of Sociology at the University of Kingston. My friends, I think I may claim to be the oldest among you. And I have spent my life studying the varied institutions of mankind. I have always been struck by the fact that every age and every community has evolved its own moral code to meet its own peculiar circumstances. And moreover, every man believes his own code to be not only the right one, but the only one for him. 
Although he would not deny that life in a penurious Indian village calls for different customs and manners from life in, say, Mayfair. What's he getting at? Thank you, madam. The point I am about to make is this. The world we knew is gone, finished. Our needs are now different, therefore our standards must be different. Uh, for instance, you have all spent the day indulging with clear consciences in what two days ago would have been housebreaking and theft. Yes, you have already lost one prejudice, and now I suggest to you that you must lose others. The only one which we dare retain is that which tells us the human race is worth preserving. Anything that will help to preserve it is good, whether we've been brought up to believe it so or not. Anything that will not help must be <coughs> abandoned. Uh, pour me some water, please. Of course, I'm so sorry. Thank you. There is one thing to be made quite clear to you before you decide to join our community. It is that the men must work the women must have babies. Unless you can agree to that, there can be no place for you. We can afford to support a limited number of women who cannot see because they will have babies who can see. In our new world, then, babies become very much more important than husbands. What are you grinning at? People's expressions. Michael looks a bit anxious. He should worry. If Brigham Young could bring it off in the middle of the 19th century, this ought to be a pushover. Think so? Here's someone who doesn't agree with you. Are we to understand that the last speaker is advocating free love? I think the questioner must be aware that I never mentioned love free, bought or bartered. <laughs> uh, will she please make the question clearer? I am asking if you suggest the abolition of the marriage law. All the laws we knew have been abolished by circumstances. There is still the law of decency. Oh, no, no, Mr... Mr... Uh, Miss Durant... A Mohammedan preserves rigid respectability with three wives. So did Solomon with three hundred. <laughs> These are matters of local custom. For our survival, we must develop our own customs in these matters. And those who choose to come with us must adhere to them. Those who do not wish to are perfectly free to start other communities on such lines as they think fit. Well, well. Oh, dear. It's nice to be alone again. Shall we sit? <laughs> What's the matter? Shall we sit this one out? Just a thought. It's a lovely night. How's your arm? Not too bad. She's quite good, that nurse. The needle was blunt by the time it got to me. <laughs> we girls were so busy arguing, we wouldn't have noticed even that. I bet you were. <laughs> How many will decide to come? Nearly all of them, by morning. You think so? Most women want babies. A lot of them prefer them to husbands. <laughs> Do they? Provided they've got some sort of security. Oh. Don't tell me you're going to cling to the old order. No, but... I don't know. It's, it's difficult. What is? I was going to ask you to marry me, but... Well, there doesn't seem any point in it now. Oh, Bill. Well, is there... I don't know. But I'll accept you all the same. Oh, my darling. Jocella. Did you... Did you really think I wouldn't? I didn't know. Of course, it isn't quite as straightforward as it seems. Why not? I think if I were the committee, I should make it a rule that every man who marries a sighted girl must take on two blind girls as well. What? Well, that's about how the numbers work out. But you don't mean that. I do, and so do they. Didn't you think it was implied in that speech? It may have been, but I don't see that they can hold anyone to it. <laughs> Meaning you don't love me enough to take on two other women as well? No, 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 but well, it's crazy, un unnatural. No, it isn't. Listen, Bill, this isn't easy for me either. 
But we do owe a sort of debt for being alive and able to see. One of the ways of paying it is to help these girls to as full a life as they can have. I think that's the queerest argument I've heard today. And yet it's right. I know it is. Very well. If that's the way you think it ought to be. Oh, darling, you do understand. I knew you would. All the same. Now, don't worry any more. I shall choose two nice, sensible girls. Oh, will you? Good. <laughs> it's getting late. You better go in. Yes, it's been quite a day. everyone and help out the blind. They're on the ground floor. Now, quick as you can. Mind the stairs. You all right, Bill? Yes, I will. Right, guys. Where's Josella? Well, she's down now. Hurry up. The <coughs> smoke's thickening. Here comes one coker. Right. Tighten the tripwire. Right. Push him, one. Right. Get him in the lorry. Right. <coughs> Here comes another. <coughs> Gisela, are you down there? Gisela. He's out. Get him away. No, wait a minute. There's another. <coughs> Not a bad bag. Not at all a bad bag. Wakey, wakey. Rise and shine. Mm. Mm. That's right. I thought I heard you. Oh, my head. You uh, had an accident, mate. That's what you had. My hands. Who's tied them up? I take it easy, cop. There's no harm intended. What's happened? I'll tell you in a tick. Here, where, where are you? Over here. Oh. Now, I've got the, got the mug of char for you. Hey, can you get it between your hands? Yeah. Got it. If it tastes a bit funny, it's the rum old Charlie put in it. Uh, hmm, who's old Charlie? He's our cook, Charlie. Who are you? Our mouth. Now tell me where I am and why I'm tied up. Ah, it's a bit of a lark, really. <laughs> Here, have a fag and I'll tell you. Lark mine, will you? <laughs> Tar. Well, you know, it was a bit of a shindy up at the university yesterday morning. I saw that. Yeah, well, after we'd scarpered, that bloke Coker that was doing all the talking, he got real nasty. And he said, you'd have to take what was coming to you. Well, we met up with a couple of other fellas as could see, and they fixed it all up between them. Fixed what? The fire. He's a lad, that Coker. Can't help laughing. Do, do you mean the fire was fixed? Well, of course it was. They rigged up a trick wire or two, lit a lot of paper and stuff in the hall, and started ding-dogging the old bell, see? As soon as you come downstairs, over you went, bonk, went coca with a gosh, and we put you on the lorry. Dead easy. Where are we? In a hotel. It's a posh one, too. Got a palm tree in the hall. Oh, I know that, because I walked into it. <laughs> Can't help laughing, can you? I can. Oh, you don't want to take it like that. How many of us did you get? A couple of dozen, but six was blind. And what are you going to do with it? Well, get organised, I suppose. Hello, is this coca now? Yes. Yeah, morning, Captain. All correct. Come on in, man. <coughs> Stand there. Now you. Name? Mason. Let's have your hands. Now, I'm going to untie them, but don't try anything on. If some rough customers around here. What the blazes do you think you're doing? I'll tell you in a minute. If you won't help other people, you've got to be made to. Yeah. Mac? Right. I'm common. Handcuffs. Here, what the... Shut up. That'll give you a bit more freedom. A bit. All you'll need. Let's have the chain, Mac. Here. I'll put the strap round my right wrist. Good. Then you get that side of him. The chain through his arm, so. Alf? Yeah. You on the other side and the strap round your left wrist. Ah, oh, yeah, right. Now, 
Sort of a shotgun wedding. <laughs> now, Mason, I want you to look at this street plan. You're going to take these two and 50 others, and you'll be taken by track to your area. Once there, you'll find them accommodation and lead them to supplies. Now, there'll be others working to right and left of you, so stay in your boundaries. How am I supposed to help anyone tied up like this? You'll manage. Now, here's your area. Made available to Fitzjohn's Avenue. No further in than Swiss Cottage, but as far out as you like. Now, I shouldn't let them get angry if I'll be you. Some of them are tough. Aye. I'm some of them of knaves, mister. I'm one. And I'll be out to check up on where you are. But otherwise, you'll be on your own till someone turns up to straighten out this mess. If they come. They'll come. <laughs> you'll probably get a medal for your noble work. Okay. Uh, one thing. Yeah? Did you get a girl called Josella Platon in your raid? I think so. Where have you sent her? Westminster. Oh, that lot won't find much grub. Not in the houses of Parliament, they won't. And don't you try wandering off to find her. He won't. I believe you, Mac. Lead them down to the street. The truck's waiting. On the best of luck, us. Six steps. One, two, three... Four, five, six. Well, we better go in and have a look around first on our own. Wait where you are. The lot is. One more small step and into the hall. Yes. Hotel, is it? Yes. Are you any palm trees? Uh, no, it's not as grand as that. Oh. Seems empty. Now, well, what's the drill? Bring them in four at a time, hands on shoulders, and find them somewhere to sleep. The first four of you. Come on. Six steps, remember. One, two, three. Oh, it's funny. I, I never thought what it'd be like tipping down three of us strung together. There's a lot of things you never thought of. Ah, shut up. No, but he's right, mate. It's going to be difficult. And how difficult will it be if your man pushes off and leaves us on our own? Ah. I never said I'd do that. But you would if you could. And I don't blame you, mate. But I'll carve you if you try. I'm no use to you dead. You won't be dead, man. Just carved. Oh, let's change the subject. Hey, what do we do tomorrow? Forage for food. Aye, and the next day we'll eat it. No, it'd be best to get quite a stock in. Spend a week or so going out every day, and then there'll be no chance of anyone else pinching it. Yeah, that's true. Huh. And afterwards we can sit back quietly here, fair lapping it up. Until uh, we run out. <laughs> Some sort of thing will happen. Don't you worry. Is anyone there? Who's that? It's a kid they call Lucy. They're coming. What do you want, ducks? A man who can sing. I'm here. Can you come up, please? There's something wrong. What is it? Some of the people are ill. They're very hot and they've got dreadful pains. I think they've got something bad. How come? And so will you two, by the way. Uh, some sort of thing will happen. <coughs> Don't you worry, Mac boy. It is. <laughs> That was episode three of The Day of the Triffids, a serial for broadcasting in six parts by Giles Cooper from the novel by John Wyndham. With Patrick Barr as Bill Mason and Monica Gray as Josella Clayton. Production for the BBC by Peter Watts. <laughs> The BBC presents The Day of the Triffids. Right. Now the chain through his arms and the strap round his wrist. How am I supposed to find supplies like this? Chained to a lot of blind men. You'll manage. And here's your area. Made of ale. I shouldn't let your lot get hungry. Some of them are tough.
Episode 4, Dead End. The morning after we settled in at Swiss Cottage, I found that the two men who'd been taken ill in the night had died, and that now three more of the party were ill. I made them as comfortable as I could, and we set out to find food. I led the party, still chained to Mac and Alf, and the remainder followed in file, their hands on each other's shoulders. Alf called out the step to stop them falling over each other. Right. Hey. Hey, Pick them up, pick them up. Where are we now, Gov? In a side street running downhill. There should be shops at the bottom. We're wandering around like lost souls. What do you expect? If you'd let me loose, I could drive round till I found a good place and then pick you all up in a truck and bring you along to do the loading. This way's bound to be slow. He's got something there, mate. Aye, an easy getaway. I wouldn't say you're wrong. Suppose I gave you my word. There's no man's word worth toppings. We're in the jungle now. Come on, pick up the step. Left, right, left. Right. We're coming yeah. to a corner. Get ready to turn left. Yeah, when you say. Stop! Oh, oh, boy. Not here. Give us a bit of warning, can't you? Shut up! A hundred yards down the street, there's a group loading a truck. They're outside their area. They aren't our crowd. The man in charge, a red-haired chap carrying a rifle. Get down! He's seen us. Down! <laughs> what is it? What is it? What's up? What's up? Max had it. Turn back the rest of you and go up the hill as if nothing had happened. Come on, mate. Run for it. No, he's coming towards us. Okay, I've undone Max's strap. We're free of him. This way, round the corner. And in here. What is it? Gone. Now, down. He'll shoot us all. No, he won't. He only wants me. Oh, yes. Where's the key to these handcuffs? In my pocket. Let's have it. Look, mate. Alf, I'll crack your skull with a chain if you don't hand it over. There you are. Good. Now keep quiet. What's happening, mate? He's taking a look at Mac lying in the middle of the road. I think he believes that he was the sighted one. Come on. Now he's following the rest of our lot. They're straggling up the hill. Come on. What? Take my arm. We'll follow him. You'll see us. I've got a stick here. If he thinks we're blind, he won't take any notice of us. That's it. Come on. Okay, you're the boss. It, but keep telling me what's up. It's not knowing that gets me down. He's about 50 yards ahead of us. The others are about 50 yards in front of him on both sides of the road. Yeah. He's not overtaking them. He wants to see where they're going. So as he can pinch our supplies, I dare say. Something like that. Hello. What is it? What about chaps is ill? He's staggering, holding his stomach. He's fallen down. What? Come on, keep going. The red-haired man's caught up with him. He's looking down at him. Down, down, he's shooting at us. Not at us. He shot the sick man. Swine. Now he's coming back. Keep going. He's gone past. Oh. Come on. We've got to get a move on if we're going to get the others back to the hotel before they get too dispersed. Do you mean you're not going to leave us? Sorry to disappoint you, Alf. I thought I could when you had me chained, but... Now I'm free to go. I seem to have been landed with a baby I can't drop. <laughs> Pity old Mac couldn't hear you say that. <laughs> He'd have died of shock. All right, that's the lot of you. Now feel your way round here to the tailboard. Got the leader, Alf? Okay. Uh, up you go, chum. Uh, uh, follow him on. <laughs> Uh, that's it. Now, and the next. That's it. Pass right down the car, please. Oh, please, steady. Don't kick the conductor in the teeth. He's doing his best. Yeah, another. Oh, uh, is that the lot, Bill? That's the lot. Tailboard up. Yeah. I'm getting handy at this. It's <laughs> nothing like practice, eh? Let's see if I can get back to the cab on my own. The real wheel. All right. Here's a petrol tank. 
Oh, cool, that's a step, yes. Okay, I'm there. How many have we got with us? Fifteen. And twelve women back at the hotel, that's twenty-seven. Four sick makes thirty-one. We was fifty-three four days ago. Four days? Is that all it is? What do you reckon this is we're all getting? I don't know. It's come out too quickly for typhoid. Could be plague. Plague? I don't know. Oh, looks like solving most of our problems, anyhow. That's looking on the bright side with a vengeance. Oh, well, keep cheerful. <laughs> what are we going to try for today? Tin milk, biscuits, candles and paraffin. Oh, well, we got 40 gallons of paraffin yesterday. We need more, much more. Why? No time to dig. Oh, that. Yes. Not that it makes much difference what you do. It's more of a taste than a smell. Yeah. Was you in the war? Uh, no, too young. I never thought the old of London had put me in mind of the fellas get two days after the battle. Oh, yeah, I'm getting morbid. Where are we going, anyway? Up towards the heath. We haven't tried that yet. Ah, get a bit of fresh air, too, eh? If pity it wasn't bank holiday, we could have had a free ride on the dodge. You think of everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not much improvement up here. Ooh. No, there are, there are more dead bodies lying around here than in most places. Yes, it's the shop, okay. Seems to be. Hang on there to the back while I open up shop. All right. Someone's been in before. They haven't taken much. Hmm. The ham's gone off. <laughs> it's here by the cold meat counter. Oh, that's it. Stay there while I see what's in the back. Hi there. Attacking the truck. Oh. Jump up and run for it. Come on, quick, towards my voice. Come on, go on. By the window. Oh, no. Gurney? Yeah. Bradshaw? Bradshaw? <coughs> Williams? Here? Yeah. Foster, Higgins, yeah. Travers, <laughs> Kendricott, Charlie's bought it, sir. Forbes, Smith. Here. Yeah. And that's the lot. You, you didn't call my name. Sorry, Lucy. Are there any more women upstairs? Not now. Seven of us, all told. And all my fault. How do you make that? I ought to have known there were Triffids up in the heath. I ought to have taken a Triffid gun up with me. You can't think of everything. Besides, the Triffids only got eight. You know what's taken the others. Yes, I know. Does anyone want anything? Otherwise, I'll go to bed. No, I'm... No, mate, we're okay. We don't need much. That's funny. The clocks, they still go on. Ah, them that's worked by clockwork will, Lucy. Until they're all run down. Hello? Hello? Anyone there? Oh, hello, mate. You woke up, have you? What was that just struck? Hmm? I don't know. It, uh, well, it must be about uh, eight o'clock by the, by the feel of the sun. Where is everyone? Cleared off. What? That kid Lucy took ill in the night. And the others got the wind up and said the place was unhealthy. And they pushed off to find somewhere else. And Lucy? She died about two o'clock. Why didn't you wake me? Well, she was out for the count. See, there wasn't anything you could have done. All the same, I, oh, I hate to think about being alone. I was there. Yes, why? Of well, course, I hadn't gone. I know, but why not? Don't you think it's unhealthy here? I think everywhere's unhealthy. Besides, it, it didn't seem like the push off without saying. But what do we do now? We have some breakfast. 
Then we make for Westminster. To find your girlfriend, right? Dead right. Oh. Huh. Yes, you've got a funny way of putting things sometimes. Uh, hand me that tin opener, will you? Where are we? Vauxhall Bridge Road, outside the cinema. Vauxhall Bridge Road, yeah. They used to have trams here once. Used to have people, too. All empty, is it? One or two lying around. Oh, no! <laughs> get out! Get out! <laughs> What's up? I, I thought one of them moved, but it was a cat. Ah, sly things, cats. Ah. Now, I wonder what Gisela would have done. Hmm? The same as us, I dare say. Found a hotel as a base. Say, there's a big one but a station. Yes, let's try that first. Are all the buses still in the station yard? Yes, all standing there, empty. Yeah, Victoria Station. Trains for Paris and the continent. Ah, uh ah. -huh. I've taken ten minutes to do these few yards on a busy day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, where are we now? Turning into Eccleston Street. Mm -hmm. oh, here's the hotel and a woman outside it. Your girl? No, she's old, but alive. Have you... You keep away. These tins are my tins. These tins are my tins. These tins well, are my I, tins. Well, I shouldn't bother with that one. It's coffee. Oh. Yeah, this one's baked beans. No. no I, I'll open them for you. Give me the tin. Give it. Were you with the party? Give me the tin. Tell me, then. Were you with the party? Yes. Led by a girl? Give me my tin. In a moment. Was there a girl who could see? Yes. Now, now give me... What happened to her? They all got ill and died, and then she went away. Oh. She wanted to take me, but I wouldn't go. Where's the point? When did this happen? Yesterday. Give me my tin. Is that all you know? Yes, my tin. Here you are. I've opened it. <gasps> What's the matter? <gasps> I can tell you that, mate, even without eyes. They've got it down here, too. Best come away. Oh, wait. Oh, oh, and I was hungry now. I don't want... I didn't... That girl was a good girl. She stayed with us. Now go... Well, this is where I came in, the university. Anyone about? Not by the look of it. There's only one truck left. Oh, maybe the one's coat that didn't Shanghai. They just, you know, pushed off. Looks like it. Mm. Oh, wait a moment. There's something pinned on the main door. Hang on, I'll go and have a look. Yeah. Hey, watch out for Triffitt. I'll take the Triffitt gun. No, I won't, though. I'll take the revolver. There's someone coming. Stay there. Don't go too far. Stand still. Put your hands up. Why, it's Mr. Coker. Yes, it's me. Don't worry, I'm not armed. Well, what are you after? Another little party? No, I've had enough. They all died. So did mine. Still, we tried the wrong way. Yes. No, but it seemed right to me at any rate. I didn't realize then that the whole world must be like this. Good, think of New York. And what are you going to do now? Go after the others and eat humble pie. Have you seen the address they left behind? Uh, no, I was on my way to look at it. Tynesham Manor, Tynesham, near Devizes. We won't get there tonight. No, I was going to bed down here and move in the morning. If you take that truck, I'll take the car. Well, couldn't we take the truck alone? I've got a passenger. Alf, here's your old friend Coker. Alf! Oh, he's gone to sleep. Wake up, Alf. No, mate. I'm not asleep. Keep away from me. Where's Bill? Here. Yeah. I've got it. Alf. No, you keep away. I've got it. I'll be dead by the morning. <laughs> I'll draw that towel to stay alive. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for all you've done, Bill. Hope you find your girl. <laughs> Just give me a drink of water and...
Time for food? Yes. Yeah, half past twelve. Oh, we made good time, considering. What are we, exactly? It's, uh, about a mile before we turn off on A361 to get down to the devices. It's hot in here. We might as well sit on the grass. Watch out for trivets. We'll see them coming on this downland. It's a bit of luck we've got this anti-tribute gear on board. No, it isn't. I put it there. That's why they didn't take this truck. They thought I was an alarmist. Biscuits? Ah, oh, thanks. What's to go on them? Patty. Mm. Beer? Ah. Here's the opener. Here, where'd you find these tankards? In the Athenaeum. Sure. Bishops have drunk from them. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, you know, I feel better. Uh, it's going to go to London. Yes, you know, out here it might be any summer's day. Less traffic. There were an awful lot of people on this island. Don't start telling me it's all been for the best. No, but something was bound to happen sooner or later. That's what Michael Beadley said. Is he? The chapel was leading the university group. They had some interesting theories. I can't wait to see how they worked out. Polygamy, among others. Three wives per man. That wouldn't work. I tried it once for a bit. What? Polygamy? Lord, no, marriage. Took me all my time to keep one in order. <laughs> oh, we're just about there. Should be on the other side of this wall. It's a stately home by the look of it. And there's the gate. Daddy. What's this, sir? Hold up. Stay where you are. Then don't point that gun at us. Is this time for manner? Stay where you are. You really might take your finger off the trigger. Where do you come from? And how many of you are there? Just the two of us. We've come down from London to join the party. What's in the truck? Supplies. All right, pass. You'd better report to Miss Durrant. She's in the dining hall. Where's Michael Beadley? I don't know. Miss Durrant's in charge. Report to her. All right. Who's this Miss Durrant? As far as I can remember, she was the one who rebelled against polygamy. Something's wrong if she's running things. Let's find out. Pamela? Cynthia? Start serving the Bimons now. I think they've all finished their first course. Yes? What do you want? Miss Durrant? Yes? We've just arrived from London. Can we have a word with you? Uh, one moment. Pam! Make the helpings larger. We don't want any left over. Yes, Miss Durrant. Now, what is it? Mr. Coker and I have just arrived. We want to know the form. Mr. Coker? Aren't you the man who led the raid on the university building? I am. Then I'd better let you know once and for all that we have no use for brutal methods in this community. I've no intention of tolerating them. What is this community? Where's Michael Beadley and all the others? They decided to move on. Why? Because we made it perfectly clear that some of us, at any rate, wish to preserve our moral standards. If you wish to stay and help us, you can. If not, please go as soon as possible. Who are all these people here? They didn't come from London, did they? They are locals. All blind? Yes. How many sighted have you? There are seven of us. What about Miss Platon, Josella Platon? Is she here? No. There's Peggy Harcourt-Smith down at the gate... Monica, Pamela, and Cynthia on duty here. Uh, Betty and Rosemary on a Triffid patrol. And uh, that's all the ones you could see. Nobody called Josella. And they're all girls here. Yeah. All the sighted ones, yes. Meaning that all the men elected to go with the other party. Which is why they went and you stayed. Naturally. With the lorries to be driven and the loading to be done, it was obviously right that they should be the ones to go. Which is why you won't last for three months. I beg your pardon? If that, you haven't got a ruddy clue. Oh. How are you going to feed all these people for a start? We shall send parties into devices to collect supplies. And the plague. What? Mm, keep away from towns. There are plenty of village stores in the neighborhood. Enough to last you for a year. Perhaps. And a year after that and the next year? What do you do then? How will you live in ten years' time, even if the Triffids don't get you first? We shall trust to Providence. Yeah, you'll do better to start building some sort of flour mill now. The wheat will be ready for harvesting in a few weeks. For heaven's sake, can't you see you've got to change your whole way of thinking or go under? I can assure you that we propose to think as we have always thought. If you disagree with our ideas, you're welcome to go and join Mr. Beadley and his friends. Where are they? Did you wish to go to? I want to find Miss Platon. Where do they go? 
I really couldn't say. Well, surely they left an address. If they did, I don't remember it. I, uh, I have an idea it was in Dorset, somewhere in the Beaminster direction. Now, if you'll excuse me, there's a great deal to be done. Uh, Monica, will you select the plates, please? Then some of the train girls can get busy watching them. <sighs> well, how far is Beaminster? Where are we? Steeple Honey. Where's that? In Somerset. Oh, it's pretty. To look at. What the blazes has happened to everyone, Bill? I mean, I can understand them getting disease in the big towns, but you'd expect people to be alive out here. There have been accidents and suicides. Well, not all that many, surely. We've come 50 miles now without seeing a living creature except a few sheep. And the dickens of a lot of triffid. Yes, sir. Uh... More and more of them. You've noticed that, too. Why is it? I've been wondering. I don't know. Hi! Hi! Is there someone there? No, we've broken our duck as far as people go. Over there in the pub. Upstairs window. Oh, yes. Can you get downstairs? Coming now! He's alive. Why aren't the others? Oh, he kept his head. They lost theirs. I don't know. We may as well take a drink from him. Where are you? Coming over. Look out! Triffid! Ah! The Triffid gun. Here. <coughs> Got it. Is the chap dead? Yes. Look, it had rooted itself in his garden, just in reach of the door. Almost as though it was waiting for him. Almost. But it couldn't have been, could it, I? I mean, they got no intelligence. Uh, they're plants. A friend of mine who knew a lot about them wasn't so sure. He thought they'd talk to each other. And do you think so? I don't know. He also said that sight was the only advantage that mankind had over Triffids. Yes, but what would be the idea of killing people? They, they can't eat flesh. If they wait long enough, they can drink it just like any other plant. Thank you. I'll have a large brandy after that little thought. No, I won't. Here come two more. Let's get out of it. This! Come on! Beaminster welcomes careful drivers. Well, let's hope somebody else does, too. Crack! Use that. The character in that doorway. Stay where you are and don't move. What's the idea? Doggy, dog? How many of you are there? Only us two. We're harmless. All right, you can get down. Come on, you are. It's all right. Oh. But who are you? Where do you come from? Have you, uh, have you any gen? What's happened? You mean you don't know? Well, only that we were all in a car smash a week ago and taken to the cottage hospital. When we came round the next morning, everybody else was blind. Oh, uh, my name's Stephen Brennell, and I'm supposed to be a stockbroker. Uh, this is Vera Paul, a, a girlfriend of mine, and uh, this is uh, Sid Farrow, who used to run a radio shop. Pleased to meet you. My name's Bill Mason. This is Jack Coker. I do know. What about the others? Well, they're up at the manor. They broke their legs. Who? The others who went in the accident. But haven't you seen a large party? A man called Michael Beadley's leading them. No, not a sign. We've been all round uh, 15 or 20 miles radius. Oh, well, my boy, we've been ahead. Miss Durant. Bless her. Look, supposing you come back to the manor with us. Then we can all put each other into our respective pictures. Oh, fair enough. Lead on. Then you see, I've sighted the machine gun so that it fires from this window covering the drive. And a mortar here to deal with anybody beyond the shrubbery where we can't see them. Well, that takes care of this side of the house. But why? Well, there's bound to be trouble sooner or later when stocks run low in the cities. We've been expecting gangs out any day. You haven't seen the cities. They're emptier than the countryside. What? Do you mean nobody in them? Yes, darling, that's exactly what he means. Oh, well, that only shows what I've been saying all along. We've got to wait for the Americans. What Americans? Well, they're bound to come sooner or later. I mean, you know, like in the war and the food parcels and all that. They won't be coming this time. How do you know? Well, because they were all out watching the comet or whatever it was as well. They're as badly off as we are. Maybe worse. They had more triffids and less canned food in these deep freeze days. But all the same, they are the Americans, aren't they? I mean, they're bound to come sooner or later. Look... You've got to get it into your head. There are no Americans. But there must be Americans. It's no good. You'll never convince her. Here, have a drink, darling, and keep quiet, eh? I believe it, though. That's why there is nothing on the shortwave. 
It's a bit paralyzing. What the blazes do we do about it? Oh, can't we just stay here and wait? No, we really well can't. I don't swear at the girl. No. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm have to blow me top a bit. Ask Bill here. He's noisy but harmless. Oh. Yes, he was being noisy that saved me. I never told you that, did I? On the night of the comet, I was down in Rotherhithe doing a bit of organizing in a strike. The police turned up, so I hid in a cellar all night. <laughs> Crime pays. Well, all the same. If we don't stay here, where can we go? My suggestion is Tynesham, where we've just come from. Why? Oh, I know you've got the girl to look for, Bill. That does give you a reason for swanning about the country. But for the rest of us, there's no point in staying here until our supplies run out. That'll take some time. Yes, but by that time, we must be self-supporting. Well, there's some good farmland around these parts. But there aren't enough of us to farm it. Well, I don't know. We might make a go. It's not good enough just to make a go. You've got to realize that this will last forever, that you've got to make entirely new lives. Oh? Look, one of the things man must have if he's to progress is leisure. Leisure. Time to learn, to study, to experiment. Oh, that's true. That's there are only six of us here. We may get one or two more in, but even that won't give us enough. Well, it means that every single person will have to work all day just to keep himself alive. Well, there's, uh, to me, there's lots of machinery lying around. Yeah, but in a few years' time, there won't be any petrol or oil. We'll have to find horses and breed from them and learn how to shoe them. And later, we'll have to learn how to smelt iron and make horseshoes. Some job. And when the candles give out, we'll have to live in the dark unless we've discovered how to make fresh ones out of tallow. Candles are made of wax. And I what? do know that. Mm, and wax is made of paraffin. Now, we got a chance to live on capital for a few years, but if we don't take the opportunity it gives us to, to learn, we should become peasants. Our children will be savages and theirs will be back in the Stone Age. Yes, but how are we going to um, Tynesham help? Well, there's more than 60 people there. Most of them are blind, but they can be trained to help. Uh -huh. We'll be a society growing and developing instead of a desperate garrison with nothing to look forward to. Are you on? Yes, I am. Uh, me too. Is it a very small place, this Tynesham? Oh, it's on all the best American maps. <laughs> oh. Well, let's have a drink on it. Miss Durant will be surprised. <laughs> if she doesn't like it, she can go and dance with the trivet. Have you had much trouble with them right here? Oh, we certainly have. Ah, but we've found something that really scares them off. Oh? Yes. Mm. When we were collecting our weapon supply at Bovington, we picked up a couple of flamethrowers. Ah. One tickle with them, and they keep well away. Just as well. You can shoot at them all day, and they don't mind. Not any more than a tree would. Well, that's what they are. Oh, I know, but you, you sort of forget it when you see them sitting around waiting to take a smack at you. There's half a dozen in every farmyard around here. They park themselves in the manure heaps. Yes, I look forward to putting in a little flamethrower practice. You sound as though they were getting you down, Bill. Funny, really. I used to regard them as part of my job. Oh, they were odd, yes, but no odder than some other hybrids we produced. But now I'm beginning to realize just what it was we were bringing into the world for money. Well, there's one thing about Tynesham. It's, it's more open up there. You can see for miles across the downs, and they can't creep up on you so much. Good Lord. What's the matter, Bill? The down, something Josanna said. Your girlfriend? Yes, back in London, she said something about some friends of hers who lived on the Sussex Downs near Poolborough. That was where she suggested we might go. I bet that's where she is. Unless what? No, nothing. Oh, I know. Unless she's caught the plague and died. She might have done. But all the same, you're starting for Poolborough in the morning. Ah, oh, don't blame you, chum. In fact, I wish you luck. <laughs> That was episode four of The Day of the Triffids, a serial for broadcasting in six episodes by Giles Cooper from the novel by John Wyndham, with Patrick Barr as Bill Mason. Production for the BBC is by Peter Watts. The BBC presents The Day of the Triffids. The Downs, of course. Josella said something about some friends with a farm near Poolborough. I bet that's where she's gone. <laughs>
Episode 5, World Narrowing. The day after the others decided to go to Tynesham, I set out for Sussex. That morning, the weather broke and the rain was falling in sheets as I said goodbye to Coker. Dorchester, Wimborne, Ringwood were drenched and deserted. The only life I saw besides the occasional triffid were two blind ponies in the new forest. After Rumsey, the sun came out, but the utter loneliness was beginning to get on my nerves. I even thought of turning round and going back to the others. But suddenly, as I passed through a village not far from Southampton, a small figure bounded out of one of the garden gates and came running up the road towards me, waving both arms. Hello, who are you? My name's Susan. I'm nine. Will you come and help me, please? Are you alone? There's Tommy, but something's happened to him. One of those things hit him. He's lying in the garden, look, and the thing's still there. Put your fingers in your ears. I'm going to shoot the top of it. Is it dead now? Yes. Horrible thing. Was Tommy your little brother? Yes. He's only six. He went out to play. I'm afraid he's dead. Poor Tommy. Shall we bury him? Yes. Is there a spade? Just over there in the tool shed. Oh, yes. Would you like to sit in the lorry? No, I shall be all right. I saw the puppies buried. You've been waiting long. Absolute ages. Are your mother and father anywhere? They've gone. One morning they couldn't see and Dad went out for help. And Mummy went to find him and didn't come back and Tommy and I waited. When did you last eat? There was lots of cheese and yet that. And then I went down to Mrs. Walton at the post office. But she wasn't there so I took some cake and biscuits and wrote a note. One of those things tried to hit me coming back. I told Tommy not to go out but he was too little to properly understand... And it was hot yesterday, so he ran out to play with his wheelbarrow while I was washing his other pair of trousers. Will he go in there? It isn't very big. It'll do. <coughs> oh, now, Susan, it's all right. It never hurt him, you know, and you've been so brave. I've been lonely. I thought nobody was coming and I was frightened. I know. I've been frightened, too, and lonely. But now I'm not, and neither are you. Better? Mm. I'll go and pick some flowers for him. <laughs> what else would modern like? A purple velvet tea gown trimmed with lace? A hat with fruit on it? Or a nice comfy corset? Oh, thank you, Susan. <laughs> now, if you've got all the clothes you need, we'd better push on. <laughs> Chichester's a nice town, but we're a long way from where we're going. Where are we going? To find a farm near Pulborough. What for? I'm looking for a lady. What sort of lady? Is she pretty? Yes. Good. Come on. We don't want to wait around here. No, it smells, doesn't it? It does. I suppose it's all the dead people. Yes. Yeah. There was one in that shop. I know. She hadn't been stung by one of those things, though. She'd fallen down the stairs and broken her neck. I looked. Oh, dear. You don't want to worry too much about these things. I wasn't. I said, oh, dear, because it's going to rain again. <laughs> so this is Pulborough. Where are the downs? Over there. Miles away. Yes, I'd forgotten they were so far. What shall we do? Well, the farmhouse she talked about was, was on the north side of the down, so we might be able to see it from here. There may be smoke or something. It's hard to see anything much in this rain. I know, and it's getting dark. A light, that's what we need. Put your Mac on and we'll use the spotlight. I wish I had a pair of gum boots. Now, you keep watching on the left while I swivel it over to the right. It's like a searchlight. Now, off. Let's see if we get an answer. Do you know 
the Morse code? No. I knew a boy called William who had a diary with it in. If we can only get one solitary gleam of light, that'll tell me all I want to know. Now again. Left and right. Left and right. Cover it up! I saw something! Well... Right over on the left. There it is again, look! Yes, you're right, Susan. You're right. Is it her? It's got to be. If you only knew the Morse code, you could ask her. Can you still see it? Through the trees, just. You want to turn left somewhere? Can't see a thing. There, a signpost. And the light's right ahead. There's someone standing by it. Is it her? Yes, it is. Josella. Hello, Bill. You've been a long time. Josella, darling. Oh, darling, darling. I've been hoping so much. Oh, Bill. Darling. You are getting wet. Why don't you kiss her indoors? Oh. Oh. Yes, come on, Bill. I've left them far too long. I'm the only one who can see among the four of us. Who are they? Dennis and Mary Brent. They were my friends, and it's their farm. Uh, and Joyce Taylor, who is staying with them. Come indoors. And after they'd all died down in Westminster, I went up to Hampstead to try and find you, and then on to the university. I went there, too. I sheared off pretty quick when I saw that man Coker prowling round and came straight down here. Coker's all right. He wouldn't have found you. I didn't know that then. Thank goodness you didn't. If you hadn't come quickly, it would have been the end of us. And to crown everything, Mary was having her baby, and the house was surrounded by triffids. Joyce was wonderful. How... How is the baby? They're both doing well. And it isn't blind. So now we have four pairs of eyes. Two grown-ups, one little girl, and one baby. And three blind encumbrances. Shut up, Dennis. No, I'm sorry. I, I don't know you well enough to say that to you, but you aren't encumbrances. You can't afford to be. <sighs> All right. But what happens next? Next I shall go to bed. Tomorrow we'll sort out what needs doing. still raining. We needed it. What for? The vegetables. Oh, this is an extremely comfortable bed. They were quite well off, Dennis and Mary. Poor things. They aren't now. Better off than some. Yes. Is it terrible everywhere? Everywhere except here. I know. That's how I feel. Oh, Bill, thank heaven you came. I was terrified you wouldn't be here. And I was afraid you'd got the plague and died. But you didn't. You haven't. It's funny to think that we're only at the beginning of our troubles. Thank you. That's a charming thing for a girl to be told on her wedding night. What on earth, sir? Oh, hello, darling. You're up. It's past milking time. You've been doing it? Yes, I'm teaching Joyce. But it's tricky for her, especially as the cows are blind, too. Hello? Can I come in? Isn't it a lovely day? Can I go out? Yes, I suppose so. No, wait. Let's see how many triffids there are sitting around. They tend to come nearer in the night. Oh, there's one by the gate. Another in the head. Two by the cow shed. Beastly things. How'd you like to do something about them, Susan? I'd love to. I've still got all that anti triffid gear in the truck. Come on, Susan, the triffid season is over. Whoopee! Three, four, five cups. How's that, Joe? Oh, fine, darling. Except one's right on the edge. <laughs> No, oh. not anymore. Oh, Lord, I can't even do that. Oh, Joyce. Uh, one step up, Dennis, and you're in the house. All right, all right. You can let go now. I know my way round. Well, we've toured the estate. And I've sliced the tops off 27 triffids. Dead eye, Susan. <laughs> I love killing them. I'm going to go out every day, Gisela, and kill as many as I can and keep a record, can I? I shouldn't think there'd be many left soon. They'll last for a bit. Tea up. Nearly. 
But we'll have to hurry. There'll be the cows to get in, the baby to bath. I can do that. Not yet, darling. The butter to make, the water to draw. And, and I've got to unload the truck before tomorrow. Why? Where are you going? Out on the scrounge. Farm implements, petrol, all manner of things. Can I come? No. Uh, there's a lot of heavy carrying to be done. Are you up to it, Dennis? <laughs> if you think I'll be any use. Of course you will. You can take one end of a 40-gallon drum as well as the next man. Thank heaven. You know you're two months old today. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. Gisela, is her hair really blonde? Actually, it's beginning to go a bit dark at the roots. <laughs> Tea's ready. Tea! Hello! Tea! All right, don't shut the place down. I was washing. Oh, sorry. We thought you were in the field. The tractor's bust. Oh, no. Anything serious? Fairly. Pass the bread round, Susan. Uh, is this the new bat? Yes. I put more soda in it. It's a dollar sight nicer than what we used to have in the old days. <laughs> Two months ago. They seem like the old days. Do you know, I bagged 40 triffids today. That makes my total 217. And still they come. What's the matter, Bill? Well, just thinking. I'll come over tomorrow if you want tractor fuel. No. I'm going on another trip tomorrow. Oh? No. I'm going over to Tynesham. That place in Wiltshire? Well, why? To fetch back two trucks and their drivers. Uh, you mean you want us all to go over there? Yes. I'll start early and take the sports car. I should do the round trip in a day. But I like it here. So do I. Besides, we've been making a pretty good go of it. No, Joyce, we haven't. Oh. We've all been working our guts out to keep the place clear of triffids and producing just about one-sixteenth of what we eat. We're storing nothing. We've stocked no firewood for winter. We're getting nowhere fast. We shall manage better in a larger community. But... Besides, there's another reason. Joe... Well, it's a bit early to announce it. But I'm going to have a baby. Oh. <laughs> Joyce, how can you tell when it's butter without being able to see? I can feel it change. You're all getting awfully good at things. Well, um... Oh, the sun's set, hasn't it? Nearly... When will Bill be back? Darling, for the 15th time, we don't know. I only wondered. And do try not to ask Gisela. It worries her. It's all right, Joyce. I'm here, bringing in the eggs. Sorry. There are some things I'm not good at yet. Of course, he may easily decide to stay the night. I dare say he will. Oh, after all, it's a longish way and he won't want to travel in the dark. All right. Uh, what is it? Listen, I can hear a car. Well, darling, how marvellous. You just made it before dark. Yes. Hello, Joe. Hi, Bill. Good trip? I got along pretty fast. What's wrong? We won't be going to Tynesham after all. It's finished. Finished? They got the plague by the look of it. Oh. Some must have got away because they took the trucks. I think they'd left a message on the door, but it had blown off all except one corner. Anyhow, there was nothing alive in sight except a few triffids growing in the drive. Then what do we do? We stay here. We learn how to support ourselves, and we go on supporting ourselves for the rest of time, if necessary. That's the ninety fifth. Post you put in today. <laughs> it feels like it. Here, pass the wire along. It'll be like the Roman War when it's done, with triffids instead of Picts and Scots wandering around outside. So twice five miles of fertile ground with posts and wire were girdled round. What? Dear me, I suppose we ought to give you some sort of education. But I am educated. Well, nearly. I mean, I can hit a triffid at 25 yards and practically milk a cow. 
Here's number 96. I can hit it, trip it at 25 yards and practically milk a cow. Perhaps she's right. Perhaps that's all the education she needs. What are you writing so busily, darling? My journal. <laughs> are you going to be the Anglo-Saxon chronicler of our age? <laughs> no, but we've got to keep a record of what we did and how we did it. You know, when we sowed and what we reaped. Otherwise, we won't even be able to learn from our mistakes. And, oh, my goodness, we're going to make some. Pressed. Not really. But I've been trying to read up a bit about farming and animal management. The trouble is that none of the writers seem to think that anyone can be as ignorant as I am. They all start halfway through. I know. It's the same with cooking and gardening. Well, I suppose we'll learn. How much ground are you going to fence off? About a hundred acres, with an inner fence to keep us out of stinging range. That's going to take you a bit of time. Time, darling, is what we have a great deal of. All the time in the world. September the 24th. We've completed the fences, and all triffids are now outside where they can stay. This means that Susan can now spend more time on farm work. She's bitterly disappointed. We've harvested 20 sacks of corn, which we winnowed in a rather primitive manner. I must now find out how to grind flour. Perhaps, perhaps a windmill. I saw a covey of partridges today flying over the stubble, but had no gun. The 12th of December. I am writing this because Bill was knocked down and trampled on by a horse he was trying to catch. He's not badly hurt, but it'll be several days before he's up and about. It's a nasty reminder of what might happen if one of us became seriously ill. We live on the edge of disaster. But I must say I feel very well, in spite of my ever-increasing size. Food stops are on. The 2nd of March. At 2 o'clock this morning, I delivered our baby. Josella was wonderfully brave and did most of the work. None of the books were any good at all, but luckily it seemed fairly obvious what was supposed to happen at each stage. We've called him David. He weighs six and a half pounds on the kitchen scale. Twelve dozen nappies, one pig trough. Spelt O-U-G-H, like plough. Why? I don't know why, it just is. Oh. Lord, it'll seem funny going to a town again. Oh, go on with the list, Susan. One gross razor blades, 20,000 vacuum-packed cigarettes, 10 pounds ditto tobacco, 10 tins ditto sweets. I didn't put that in. I did. That's fair, Bill, if we're having cigarettes. Besides, I like sweets, too. Oh, do you, Mary? All right, carry on. That's a lot. Good. Now, there should be quite a bit of space left over if we take the ten-tonner. What other things do you want, if we can get them on? Your braille books. Yes. Well, when we get to Brighton, I'll go through the telephone directory and see if there's anywhere where we can get them. If not, we'll have to wait till we go to London. Are you sure it wouldn't be better to go to London anyway? I don't think so. Brighton, being smaller and by the sea, is certain to be safe after a year... London's still a slight risk. Sight, it's a jolly sight nearer. Any more requests? If you could get a hand loom and some yarn. Oh, and a potter's wheel and clay. Jodhpurs. Home perm outfits. A gramophone for the long winter evening. We might have a, a cine projector for the children. Oh, yes, and a film camera and take films of us all. Well, why not what the butler saw from the Palace Pier while we're about it? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I can hear the triffids outside the wire. Yes, they're a lot noisier lately. Because there are more. Hadn't you noticed? No, I've got more to do than count triffids. Well, there are. Several hundred all round us outside the wire. As long as they stay there and let us get on with the work, that's all that matters. We'll leave for Brighton first thing, Dennis. It feels like a good road. It is. Remember it? Through the downs and straight into Brighton. Yeah. We've just passed the turning to Lewis. Today's Saturday, isn't it? Yes, why? Think of the traffic that had been a year ago. I know, and now not a thing in sight. Hello, yes, there is. What's wrong? About 50 yards ahead, there's a roadblock, and somebody's painted Keep Out in large letters right across. They've no right to do that. Someone fired at us, didn't they? Yes. Quick, help me out, quick! Steady, steady. <laughs> they weren't trying to hit us, or they'd have succeeded. 
But all the same, we'll take their advice. Where shall we go? London. You said it wasn't safe. Safety is relative. Where are we? Top of Lower Regent Street, looking across Piccadilly Circus. At the clock. One of its hands has fallen off. Is Eros still standing? Yes. Well, go on. Tell me more. I want to know what it's like. Like Piccadilly Circus empty. Sometimes when I lived in London, I used to get up early in summer and walk. About five o'clock on a summer morning, it was just like this. Was it? There's a musty smell. That's the chief difference. All around, on the steps of Eros, at the entrance to the London Pavilion, under the colonnade in Regent Street, there are little heaps of clothes with bones sticking out of them. And you say it's no different. Well, let's go shopping, shall we? Buried under 50 yards of good, serviceable, moth-eaten cloth at the back. Oh, you are a beast. Is it really moth-eaten? It may be. We chose the best we could find, but moths and cockroaches are the only things left alive in the big stores. Oh, Oh, I don't know. We were glad of their company. The silence was fantastic. Is there anything else to come out tonight? The sweets! Oh, here you are. Here's an odd tin I left out. Run away and make yourself safe. Hand them round, darling. As we are dealing in luxuries, we may as well have this crate of bottles out. <coughs> I've got it. I'll take it. Oh, I've got something else for you. What on earth is it? What the butler saw. Bill, it's the Rokeby Venus. Plus a can of letto, a constable, and a Franz Hals. Oh. Well, nobody seemed to want them, so I pinched them from the National Gallery. going to make all the difference to them. Do you think they're unhappy? Mary and Joyce are all right. They can keep themselves busy in the house. Dennis chafes a bit. He'd be better now. He's learned quite a bit of Braille already, and we brought back a stack of books. He's not the type to spend his time reading when everyone else is working. It'll be his work. I want him to read up all the medieval stuff he can find. What? I want to know exactly what villages did in those days, or what they used for soap and sugar and buttons and needles and cough mixture. Are we really going back to that? If we can't, it's going to be a poor lookout. Oh, Bill. Bill, I wasn't made for this kind of life. It was dreadful. Darling. Oh, Bill. Oh, sorry. Self-pity. Revolting. Must be the gin. <laughs> and the music. After all, we've survived a year. And we're better off than we were when we started. Better off by David, at any rate. Oh, and a thousand things. There's the mill and the animals and the garden really beginning to get organized. And you. Yes, as long as we stay together, I don't see how things can help you. What are we going to drink for breakfast when there's no more tea or coffee? <coughs> Beer. Jolly good show. You, my girl, will go on drinking milk. Swiss, how will we make the beer? Brew it from barley. What's the lower field looking like? Pretty healthy. I've been thinking of pushing out the fence to extend it. By the way, who said there were more triffids around? Me. You were right. I've never seen so many except in a nursery. What are they doing? Just rooted there, being triffids, but more every day. I wonder why. Do you think there's a special reason? Of course there is. He brings them. Don't point. And why should I bring them? Do you think I whistle to them in my sleep? No, but you make most of the noises round the place, sawing and hammering, and they hear you. Oh, nonsense, darling. They're plants. They can't hear. All right. Look, Bill. Do you see that triffid crossing the field down the valley? Uh, yes. Fire your gun out of the window. Just fire it in the air. Anything to oblige the young. Now, tell them what you saw. The triffid stopped moving. It's swiveling on its roots, and... Yes, now it's begun to come this way. It'll come on for about ten minutes, then it'll stop and listen. If it can hear the others by the fence clattering, it'll keep coming on. But if it can't, it'll turn off and go wherever it was going. You've been watching them very closely. I always watch them. I hate them. She's right, you know, Bill. But they're plants. They've no ears. They can't hear. 
Then they do something so like it that only a biologist could tell the difference. Don't you remember, Mary, how they broke loose and began crowding round the house the moment we all went blind? They often did that in tropical countries before people went blind. But not here. Here they were always under control and they never even tried to make trouble until things went wrong. But then they took advantage of it at once. Why? Why well, can remember them breaking out of their enclosures before. But not altogether. How did they break out? They crowd up against a portion of their fence until the pressure breaks it down. Oh, Bill. Their fence? Or ours? July the 1st. At last we found what we were looking for, an RAOC depot containing flamethrowers and fuel. I brought four back today, and with Josella's help, we destroyed about 500 triffids. August the 10th, busy harvesting. I've learned how to make a horseshoe, which the horse apparently considers wearable. Notes opposite. We set fire to several hundred triffids on the northern wire in an early morning drive. It is October the 17th and my 11th birthday. Mary gave me a rug she had knitted. We are getting awfully short of fuel for the flamethrowers and are going to try something else. I am doing the journal because W. Mason Esquire and D. Brent Esquire have gone to London to fetch sulfuric acid from a chemical works in Romford. Watch out! Oh, oh. What's it? A sign that we can't come here anymore. Fainham House crashed into the street behind us. Oh, vibration of the truck? Yes. And it'll happen again if we're not careful. This is our last visit to Piccadilly. What does it look like now? Better. How? As though it belonged to another race. Nothing to do with us. There's a sycamore growing out of a shop window, and all the pavements are covered with green moss. You can't see the fountain for willow herb and thistles. We can leave it to the antiquarians now and go home very slowly. Oh, no. Not morning already. Hello? Hello? I'll be with you in a moment. Do you know that before I married a farmer, I never got up before nine o'clock? Before I married a farmer's wife, I... <laughs> Susan! What's happening? Anything wrong? Oh, I can see. I thought I couldn't. Of course you can see. Look, it's dark down there, downstairs. Oh, the curtain's drawn. I drew them back before he went to bed. Oh, Bill, what is it? I'll see. Where's the toy? How can it be dark on one floor and light on another? Be careful, darling. You can come down. Is it all right? No, it's not all right, but you're quite safe here. Look at the window. Leaves. Triffid leaves. Oh. Press tight against them, yes. They've broken through the fence in the night, and now they're all around the house. Oh. They want us very badly. <laughs> That was episode five of The Day of the Triffids, a serial for broadcasting in six parts by Giles Cooper from the novel by John Wyndham, with Patrick Barr as Bill Mason, Monica Gray as Josella, and Gabriel Blunt as Susan. Production for the BBC by Peter Watts. The BBC presents The Day of the Triffids. Why is it so dark? Look at the window. Leaves! Triffid leaves! They've broken through the fence in the night and now they're all round the house. Oh. 
They must want us very bad. <laughs> Final episode, Strategic Withdrawal. Flames, right? Yes. Keep the window shut. Take your mask. I've got it. I'll keep the flame down as much as I can. Stand back while I open the door. Ready? Yes. Here goes then. He'll never get through. Are you all right? Shut that window. I've got a mask, Josh. Oh. Have they hurt you? No. Bit of poison in my goggles, that's all. I've got the flamethrower. Some of them are turning back to us. Let them all come. Here we go. Hooray! Hooray! Oh, Bill, May the 20th. We've been here four years. We now have five beehives and are hoping to be able to make some mead to keep our spirits up during the winter. There was a triffid breakthrough this morning, the first since we began spraying round the wire with arsenic back in January. Either they've adapted themselves to it or heavy rains diluted it. Dennis suggests that we should try to get hold of a second generator from somewhere and electrify the fence every so often to stop them crowding against it. Okay, that's cleared them away. All right, I'll switch the generator off. Bring a few logs if you're coming in. We'll have to cut some more tomorrow. I could do it by myself. No. I jolly well could. Fourteen's too young to work a circular saw. I worked it while you were away getting seaweed. For heaven's sake, don't argue. Ah, oh, logs. Here you are, Joyce. Can you manage? Yes. I've got them. Oh, <laughs> oh, help us, Susan. Oh, sit down, Bill. I'll bring you some beer. You didn't run the generator for long this evening. Long well enough. They're all cleared off. They don't go as far now as they used to. They know that when it's not working, they're safe. Perhaps we ought to run it more often. What on? Are you short of petrol? Yes. Ah. There used to be a place over at Henfield that had a goodish stock. Have you tried that? Not yet. I was thinking, as a matter of fact... If instead of taking the half-track, you found a tanker, you could carry a lot more. If I could get a tanker along roads that have almost stopped being roads... Well, if there's only an idea. What you don't seem to realise is that in a year or two, there won't be any petrol. To put in a tanker or anything else. Oh, yes, I do. And I've been thinking about that, too. We need a stronger fence, then. It should be possible to build a stockade of telegraph poles strong enough to keep anything out. Possible? For who? If you could get hold of a light crane, it would help. And if I had ten arms, it would help even more. Bill! Well, I'm sorry, but I get fed up with everybody having brilliant ideas which only need me to sweat my guts out to put into practice. Don't you think I'd like to be able to sit back and think for a change? Well, don't you? Pencils, paper, pepper, a pot, gun and a plastic pot. What? <laughs> Isn't it a nice list? There are one or two other things. We can get them all in Little Hampton. Can we? Yes, tomorrow. We'll take the half-track and have a picnic by the sea. Don't be silly. I've got a thousand things to do tomorrow. Nothing more important than this. Besides, we've never both been away together at the same time. That's why it's important. But... Susan can look after everything perfectly well. Hey, more birds this year. The sea must be crammed with fish, with nobody taking any. The south coast in August, think of it. <laughs> I prefer it like this. Wouldn't you like to jam your deck chair in between two other families and contemplate the ice cream tubs and old newspapers? <laughs> Would you? <laughs> there were an awful lot of us before this happened. Yes. Look at those bungalows across there. Do you remember all the outcry there used to be about spoiling the countryside? It's got its own back now. <laughs> they didn't look all that much different. If you look properly, they do. Do you see all the... All the moss on the roofs. Look at the way the waters streak the walls. Mm. Think of all those three-piece suites with nettles growing up through the artificial leather. <laughs> and the veneer peeling off the television set. It was a tawdry civilization. Which was why it crashed. 
You can't blame civilization for the comet, unless you still think it was a satellite that went wrong. I'm sure it was. Michael Beadley once said that we'd been walking on a tightrope for years. We fell off it, that was all. The Triffids, too. Nobody's fault, but everybody's. Because... We went merrily ahead in our own interests without bothering about the possibilities. That's a glum train of thought. Still, it's a mental process. What a change for me. I told you it would do you good to have a break. <laughs> yes, darling, you did. Was that frightful to Dennis yesterday? Hmm, a bit hard, but he understood. The worker's resentment of the intellectual? <laughs> More or less. I never realized it was so easy to slip into too much hard work does make one stupid. Oh, darling, we all depend on you. And you. And here we are, lying in the sun. <laughs> we might be worse off. In a way, the last five years have been the happiest of my life. Oh. Listen, what's that? Trivia? No, no, listen. The plane can't be. Wait. There it is. Look. A there. helicopter. <laughs> Hi! Wave something, a, a towel, quick! Oh, I haven't got... Oh, Hello! Hey! Hi! Stop! Oh, what oh, a pretty man! Hello! <sighs> you never saw us. Silly shouting, really. You couldn't have heard. He's gone inland. Where can he have come from? He seemed to be flying along the coast. Of course, it may be someone from another family group like ours. If they can service and fly a helicopter after all these years, they must be fairly well organized. I mean, it's no good assuming that they could have rescued us, even if they'd seen us. No, but all the same... Oh, I... darling, I know, I know. Makes you want to sit down and howl. Oh, we better pack the things up and start for home. Oh. Look, clear. That's better. What made me think this might be a better road, I do not know. Oh, it's not much worse than the other. Hop up on that bank and see what it looks like ahead. If it's too bad, we'll turn around and go the other way. Well, how do you tell if it's too bad? Or well, if you can see a road at all, we'll use it. Bill, here, quick. What's the matter? I can see the farm and a huge great cloud of smoke. It could be Triffids burning. Oh, no, no, Bill, you know it isn't. They've had a fire and only Susan's left to fight it. Quick! The wood pile. Why should the wood pile be on fire? Oh, yes, Susan. Oh, thank heavens. Susan, what's happened? Look, over on the lawn, look! The helicopter. I lit the wood pile with a flamethrower as a signal. Oh. Where's the pilot? I'm here. Mr. and Mrs. Mason, I presume. And your name's Ivan something. Simpson. Oh, yes, of <laughs> course. You brought in a helicopter that first day. But are you still with Michael Beadley's lot? Yes. I've been telling your friends about it. Well, let's go in and celebrate while you tell us to. Thanks. And... Um, First of all, Michael told me that I was to be sure to start off with his apologies. To me? You were the only one who saw any danger in the Triffids, and he didn't believe you. But how did you know I was here? Well, we found out the rough location a few days ago from a man called Coker. Coker? Oh, I was afraid the plague had got him a tension. No, he got away with some survivors. Maybe down in Cornwall. But what about you? Where did you go? Oxfordshire first. We were told Dorset. <laughs> yes. That was a deliberate piece of misdirection by that woman who disliked our ideas so much. Oh, Miss Durrant. Your memory's better than mine. <laughs> anyway, we weren't in Oxfordshire for long before we found the Triffids were too much of a problem. So we upped sticks and went to the Isle of Wight. Is that where you come from today? Yes. You see, once we'd wiped out all the Triffids on the island, there weren't any more. It took a bit of time, but the whole island's clear now except for seeds blown over from the mainland, and we deal with those each spring. We're about 300 strong, with our headquarters in a country house near God's Hill. You've multiplied all right, haven't you? <laughs> well, we've been recruiting from outside as well. <laughs> I tour the country whenever I find a group of survivors. I drop down and invite them to join us. And, and do they? Sometimes. Sometimes not. 
There are quite a lot of little tribal communities that don't want to be governed anymore. There's one at Brighton that even shoots at the aircraft. I know. They warned me off, too. It's the same at Guildford and Maidstone. I suppose they've got a lot of stores and they're scared of other people wanting them. How do you do for surprise? Well, we had the whole island and Portsmouth and Southampton to draw on. But we're feeding ourselves now and beginning to branch out. How? Oh, a fishing fleet, a cement works and an iron foundry. Do you know we even brought a load of ore down by sea from Northumberland last summer? <laughs> just to prove that we could do it. The next thing will be an expedition to the Nottingham oil field. And we hope to get the Forley refinery working. <laughs> it sounds a busy life. It is. There's plenty of room for helpers. You could be very useful. I have learned to do a good many things in the last few years. Oh, I don't mean farming. That's all looked after. But you're a biochemist, aren't you? <laughs> well, a biologist with a little chemistry. That's too fine a distinction for me. The point is, Michael's been trying to get some research going into a method of knocking off trippids scientifically. A selective killer? Something like that. If we're ever going to extend, we've got to find one. But the trouble is that the only people to work on it are a few who have forgotten even the biology they learnt at school. What about it? Would you like to turn, Professor? There's nothing I'd like better. Does this mean that you're inviting us all to your island haven? Or to come on mutual approval. What does that mean? Well, Bill and Gisela probably remember the broad principles laid down that night at the university. We still keep to them. All of them? Yes. How do you feel about that, Gisela? I made up my mind about it years ago. Don't you remember? You see, we aren't out to reconstruct. We want to build something new and better. Some people, <laughs> some people don't take to that, and it's better to let them go elsewhere. That sounds a pretty poor offer under the circumstances. Oh, well, we don't throw them back to the Triffids. No, there was a party of about a hundred that split off from us and went over to Guernsey. They've cleaned it up and they're doing all right. They, if anyone's odd enough to prefer it. Sounds a bit dictatorial. <laughs> Pioneer governments have to be. How is this council formed? The best thing is for you to come along and find out how it all works. Even if you don't like it. You'll find the Channel Isles a better spot than this is likely to be in a few years' time. Bill! Bill, you out there? Here. What are you doing? Taking the evening air, looking at the view, thinking. You've escaped quite an argument. They've been hard at it ever since Ivan left. What's the upshot? They'll come, but they don't want to. Surely they can see... No, Bill, they can't. Quite literally, I mean. They can't see the Triffids like a thick hedge all round. And beyond them, the country's sinking back to marsh and forest. They still think of a tidy countryside, lanes and fields and cottages. Besides, they know their way round here. Oh, it must be awful moving house when you're blind. It's our home, too. I know. We've made it. Oh. We could stay here or two longer. What do you think? No, not now. No point. And think of the children. That's what finally made the others decide to leave. All the time I've been haunted by something Coker said years ago. The first generation peasants, the next savages. Well, that's the way we're heading, unless we admit defeat and go. Not defeat. A strategic withdrawal. <laughs> All right, but when? Let's have the summer here. We can live off stores and have a sort of holiday. Very well. And on the 20th of September, when the schools used to reassemble, we'll pack up and drive down to Portsmouth. We'll flash a light to the island and wait for a boat to pick us up. Fancy being in a boat again. And yet, you know, I shall cry buckets when we do leave. That's twenty sacks. One ton. Put up the tailboard. I'm sorry about this. Why? If I hadn't burnt the wood pile yesterday, you wouldn't have had to come and get coal today. All in a good cause. I shan't have to do it again. Shall I like it in the Isle of Wight? Yes. Drusilla said I'd be going to school. You will. But I know everything now. I can milk and drive a tractor and harness a horse and shoot trippies. <laughs> there are other things worth learning. Oh, all right, if you say so. But I won't have to leave you, will I? No, you'll always stay with us. Now, come on. Let's go home and start our holiday.
I'll open the gate. Put your mask on. Oh, it'll be marvelous never having to wear these things when we get to the Isle of Wight. I say, look, we've got more visitors. Ivan again? No, in the yard there. That's not one of our cars. What on earth is it? Well, the top part looks like a sort of caravan. There's no doubt about the bottom part. It's a tank. Here, hurry up. Let's go and find the owner. This is my husband and our adopted daughter. Bill, this is a Mr. Torrance. He says he's some kind of an official from Brighton. These other men are with him. How do you do, Mr. Mason? We've met before. I don't think so. Oh, yes, we have. On the second day of the disaster, you fired at me up in Hampstead. Oh, did I? Well, those were bad days. Shoot first and ask questions afterwards, eh? As times have improved, perhaps your friends would like to park their Sten guns outside. They're all right here. It's a man's best friend, you know, as they used to say in the army. The boys get attached to them. Why did you say you want to see me? I understand you're in charge here. Well, the place belongs to Mr. Brent. Yes, but you're the organizer. I'm Commander, Southeast Region. Well, what does that mean? It means that I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Emergency Council for Southeast Britain. Never heard of it. We didn't know about you until we saw your fire yesterday. Well, now that you do know, what about it? When a group like yours is discovered, it's my job to investigate and assess it. Why? In case adjustments have to be made. So you can take it from me that I'm here officially. On behalf of an official council? What else? Or a self-elected one? There has to be law and order. Here's my warrant, if you'd like to see it. I'm blind. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> well, Mr. Mason, this is a well-found place you have here. That Mr. Brent has. Mr. Brent is only here because you made it possible for him to stay. But it's his property. It was. Meaning what? All titles to property have ceased to be valid. Besides, Mr. Brent is blind. He's not competent to hold authority. So shut your mouth, blind, and keep it shut. Well, then let's get down to business. Your wife says there are eight of you here. Five adults, this girl, and two small children. All of you are sighted except these three here. Check. Correct. We won't have to alter that. What? Well, it's disproportionate. It happens to be the way we like it. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sure it is. But we've got to be realistic these days. I don't quite gather what we have to be realistic about. Yes, well, I'll put you in the picture. Regional HQ is in Brighton. Yeah, we paid you a visit once and got a shot across our bars. Yeah, I dare say. We've had to discourage outsiders because of supplies. We've been there ever since London got too bad. It's a big place, and we were able to isolate part of it until the sickness passed. Since then, we've been living on the stocks we found there, plus what we've run in from other towns. But all that's folded up now. The roads are getting too bad and petrol's running low. So, we're beginning to disperse and live off the land. Or, in other words, having used up all your own supplies, you're starting to pinch other people's. Shut up, Dennis. It's bare-faced robbery. They've got no authority over us. Shut up. Bill. Let me handle this. Tell me your plans, Mr. Torres. You've got a good place here. Fully capable of supporting two units. A unit being what? One sighted person to ten blind. Plus any children. We shall allocate to you a further 17 blind persons, making 20 with the three you already have. And, of course, children. Well, 20 people can't live off this land. It's impossible. It can be done. Oh, of course, you will be in command of the double unit. Supposing I don't choose to. Then we put someone else in. We can't afford waste in these times. All the same, I still say the land can't do it. It will. Mind you, you'll have to lower your standards. We'll all have to tighten our belts for a few years. But in the end, you'll get the payoff. How? Well, in six or seven years' time, the children will have grown up a bit. You'll have labor to expand with. Then you can relax and just supervise. You'll be the head of a clan that's working for you. You'll have an inheritance to hand on to your son. What you're really offering is a kind of feudal seigneury. Yeah, that's it. Just the word. And with all the rights, if you know what I mean. Well, it's the only practical way to work under present conditions. But what on earth are they going to eat at the start, Mash Triffid? That's cattle, Holmes. But very nourishing, filthy stuff. Look, Mr. Mason, you're still doing some old-fashioned thinking. What are these people? Why are they alive? Because of us. Okay, then. They do what we tell them and eat what we give them. Beggars can't be choosers. 
especially when they're blocked. Bill, shut up! Just where do you and your council stand in all this? Exactly where the monarch would stand in a feudal system. We rule and control the armed forces. Armed forces? They will be raised as and when necessary by levies on the seigneuries, as you call them. In return, you have the right to call on the council if they are attacked, or when you have trouble from your workers. I should have thought a small police force was all you needed. Oh, but you've got to think ahead. After all, every country in the world is in the same state. One of them is going to be the first to get back on its feet, and that country will dominate all the others. It's our duty to be that country. And that is why we need an army. No, no, what? no. We've lived through this agony all these years. And now the man proposes to start a war. We're getting a bit tired of you, mate. You talk too much, Blondie. And I never said anything about a war. It will simply be a question of pacifying and administering tribes that have reverted to lawlessness. Unless they think of it first. Which is why we have got to be prepared. Is it all clear, Mr. Mason? Yes, I think so. You expect the three of us here to be responsible for 20 blind people and a number of children. Two, not three. Yourself and your wife. And Susan. Sorry. The allocation is ten per unit and we can't make exceptions. We'll find work for her at headquarters until she's old enough to run a unit on her own. Oh, with some chap. My wife and I regard her as our own daughter. We've got to stick to the regulations. Yes, of course. Sorry, Susan, but orders are orders. Besides, you'll do all right at HQ, my girl. It's in the pavilion. Of course, we <laughs> would expect certain guarantees with regard to her education and so on. Oh, naturally. There's a good deal to be thought of. Such as? Some of our equipment's wearing out. We're going to need a couple of good draft horses soon. Oh, it's difficult. We must have them. Well, not for a bit. Well, how do we plow? Hitch all your blindness to the plow and make them pull it. All you have to do is encourage them. You've thought of everything. That's what the council is for. What about housing? Well, we'll bring up a couple of prefabs and put them up for you. Oh, thanks. Well, that will be a help. Anyone who cooperates with us can be sure of every possible assistance. It would be quite a relief, in a way, not to be entirely on our own. Well, now, I dare say you'd like to see round the place. We're rather proud of our anti-triffid fence. Then we'll have a drink or two on the deal. How's that? Well, that's fine. But we can't stay too late. I'd better have a wash first. I'm covered with coal. Susan, start showing Mr. Torrance and his friends round the estate. Me? Yes. It'll give her a chance to get to know you. I'll join you in a moment. This way. Bill. Oh, Bill, how could you? What? Let him get away from the door. Now. Make no mistake about it. Those men are very dangerous. But we can't do what they suggest. Of course we can't. You really see me driving my serfs before me with a whip. But we're not in a position to give a flat no to a proposition put up by four armed men. Surely we don't have to give them such a hearty yes. I agree. For the moment we must. Now listen. I think their idea is to leave tonight taking Susan with them as a sort of hostage. No. And perhaps one of them will stay behind to keep an eye on us. Well, that is not what's going to happen. I'm going out to join them in a moment, and this is what I want you to do. Hey, she can join. Yes, Hang on, that's what it's called. I remember now. Rock and roll. Who's going to empty gas? Mr. Torrance. Was it mead or whiskey? Give him both. Oh, steady on. Oh, you can't have too much of a good thing, can you, Commander? Well, see, I'm going to join <laughs> Cheers. You know, I like you, Bill. You're all right. Yeah, yes, well. you're all right. You've got a bit of sense. You know, some of these people don't have any. Now, do you know what? Some places we go, they don't want us. Tell us to go away. Well, that's true, do you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Remember Louis? Yeah, that's yeah. just what I mean. They told us to push off, but Louis yeah. told us. And what did you do? 
Lined them up against a cow shed and shot the rotten lock. <laughs> well, you've got to be firm. Yeah. Any empty glasses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've yeah. got to show them who the masters are. With another record on, Blighty. Coming up. And then we'll all go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Already? Yes. Are they asleep? Flat out. Down you come. The half tracks in the garage. Mary, Dennis, Joyce, and Susan get in the back. You got Jean, haven't you? Yes, she's asleep. Keep her that way. Shall I bring David in front? Yes, go on now. I'll follow. Mummy. Shh. Lock them in. Quietly. Is this the food? Yes. Stow it behind you. Don't shut the door. Oh, hurry, hurry. All right in the back? Yes. 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 Then hold on tight. I'm going to have to crash the gate. Here we go. Shut the doors. Hold tight! We're through! Mind your eyes! We're past the tripping! Right! What's the matter? Why are we still Go on, Bill! Go on! It's all right! I just want to see whether they follow us. If they do, we'll have to make a day tour before we go to Portsmouth. Of course they'll follow us. I don't think so. They're out of the house. They're climbing into their machine. Oh, Bill, let's go. No, Bill. wait. They've switched on the headlamps. Hello? What happened? Sick, let's get away. Listen. That's all right. What's happened? There's ten pounds of your honey in the petrol tank. I hoped it would do the trick. Oh, oh look, the trivets are swarming in. Yes, they'll be stuck there now till someone turns up to rescue them. Portsmouth, here we come. How's David? Asleep. And are you crying, Buckets? No. We're leaving. Why? I've got all I want. And someday we'll be coming back. We arrived at Portsmouth at seven o'clock in the morning, and by midday we were over here. We decided to stay, and here we are. Well, that's all for me. Josella? I've no more. Thank you. Well, that's a jolly good interview. Just filled it up that reel of tape, too. Thanks, all both <laughs> of you. That's all right. <laughs> but you said you would go back, Bill. When we've beaten the Triffids. Bill, there must be hundreds of thousands on the mainland by now. And more every year. Torrance's senior is have had it, and I don't think any of the other communities will last long. So is there any hope then, Bill? I think so, yes. Meaning you're on to something? We might be in a few years' time. As long as that. Well, it took thousands of years for us to become clever enough to make anything as foul as a Triffid. We can't expect to undo our work at once. But we're on the right road, I'm sure of that. And someday we or our children or their children will go back across the straits. And the Triffids will have had their day. That was The Day of the Triffids. The final episode of the serial by Giles Cooper from the novel by John Wyndham. With Patrick Barr as Bill Mason and Monica Gray as Josella Platon. Production for the BBC was by Peter Watts.